Well, good evening, everyone. Sego ani buju endio wachea kwe kwe. As the mayor of the city of Kingston, I offer these words in the spirit of this gathering. Let us bring our good minds and hearts together as one to honor and celebrate these traditional lands as a gathering place of the original peoples and their ancestors who were entrusted to care for Mother Earth since time immemorial. It is with deep humility that we acknowledge and offer our gratitude for their contributions to this community, having respect for all as we share this space now and walk side by side into the future. So we were just meeting in committee of the whole closed meeting. We were discussing several items, uh, the Ontario Land Tribunal Appeal for 51 Allington Avenue, some legal communications and potential legal proceedings. So I will ask for a motion to rise without reporting, please. Moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor Chenani, that Council rise from the Committee of the Whole closed meeting without reporting. All those in favour? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, moving on to the approval of the adeds, we have uh, an additional clause for uh, Clause 3 from Report Number 43 and some communications. Can I have a mover and a seconder for the adeds? Moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Hassan. All those in favour? Opposed? And that's carried. Are there any disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? Councillor Glenn. Sorry, it's for you. Uh, I, Connie Glenn of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of Clause 2, Report 42. I have a family member who attends at the Heart Centre. Okay, thank you very much. If there are no Mayor other... Patterson. Mayor Patterson, I'm gonna, I can't get my video to work, so I do have a pecuniary interest. Can I read it and then... Um, yes, uh, I, yeah, go ahead. Thank you, but I apologize. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, I, Gary Ostroff of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of Clause 2, Report 42, regarding our service level agreement with Heart Studios, as I have a family member who utilizes these services. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Councillor Ostroff, I think until we get your video working, uh, what would, okay. Hopefully we can get that going. So we'll, we'll work on that. Uh, but otherwise we will continue on uh, in our agenda. Uh, we have no presentations this evening, but we do have some delegations. We have three delegations in our agenda. Once we've done those three, then I will look to council if there are any additional delegations to add. Um, just a reminder to all of our delegations that you have up to five minutes to speak. Uh, and then there will be an opportunity for questions from members of council. Uh, so first, uh, we'll invite Dave Stewart to appear before Council to speak to Clause 2, Report Number 43, uh, with respect to the Sleeping Cabin wind-down plan. Good evening, Mayor Patterson, Councillors, staff, and attendees. My name is Dave Stewart. I'm a Kingston taxpayer who began my involvement with Our Livable Solutions, or OLS, uh, in 2021, as a member of the Housed Advisory Committee, over a year and a half ago, I joined the board. We're here tonight to give a perspective on the true value of the sleeping cabin community and to offer a viable option for winding down the city's involvement in the funding of the community while maintaining it as a unique resource, a part of the puzzle in reducing homelessness. Thank you for uh, providing this delegation time. It's really necessary because we got the feedback from councillors in November that despite the flood of letters and emails in support of the cabins, many of the councillors were overwhelmed, didn't get a chance to take those in, and they felt that there had not been enough heard from the supporters of the community. In November in this chamber, the phrase, we can do better, was uh, bandied about freely as council voted to wind down the cabins. The irony is that we were already doing better. Both OLS as an organization and the sleeping cabins as a community were doing far better than was able to be captured in the parameters of the staff report uh, on the sleeping cabins. 
The aim of the Sleeping Cabin community is to foster independence while giving support. Support and accountability are our key values. As the Housing First philosophy mandates, we accept people where they're at, our low barrier, safe environment where a person can lock their door, like other house people do, gives our community members the space and time to shed some of the reflex ways of acting that have been crucial to their survival on the streets but may seem dysfunctional in other situations. This transition takes time and stability. The frequent cabin moves, while necessary, have caused a lot of upheaval. A permanent location is required, and we're working on that. What the pilot study was never able to capture was the many positive effects that this well-staffed initiative provided. Reconnections with family, decreased substance use, fewer and less severe emergency room visits, preventative or corrective surgeries and dentistry that were most effective when people had a place to recover. This, was, um, this led to really high retention rates within the community. The pilot project with raw city funding numbers missed the context comparison of the total cost that other programs um, were involved, balanced with the support that they offer. Our staffing also contributes to our being good neighbors. Those that have had, uh, taken the time to know the community have come to support us, assuming they even realized that we were there. Where there are problems internally or with outsiders, we have the resources and expertise to work things through. Councillors past and present, I must say, have also been instrumental in facilitating communications within their neighbourhoods. OLS grew out of the initial Bell Park encampment. As long as we've been, all along, we've been guided by the expertise of people with lived experience. Potential residents, residents, staff and board have all been through their own experience or have experienced that with loved ones being at addictions, mental health challenges, illness, or being precar precariously housed. The people who speak in support of the cabins are those that have been able to take the time to understand their true value. As neighbors, they no longer have the natural fear of the unknown. Instead, having actually experienced living with the cabin as neighbors, many have taken the time to hear the stories, see the progress, and really see how things work getting away from the stereotypes. Some quick items of progress since November are as follows. A number of people and groups have come forward and are working with us on um, accessing land for a permanent long-term location. This is a, there's a real hope that this could be accomplished by the end of September. Certainly, we will have a better understanding by the end of the summer. As an incorporated not-for-profit, our application for charitable status was filed in January. This may take a year or more, but in the meantime, we've been able to set up a flow-through account with the Community Foundation through whom donors can receive charitable receipts. The city qualifies uh, as an eligible donee and could support us in accessing these funds at no cost to taxpayers. The type of support could also widen the scope of grants from other sources that would, we could potentially access. We're confident that the move in September could be a permanent move to a location on private land we will know well in advance if that is going to come to fruition. 30 seconds. On the downside, the proposed funding model between now and September is unrealistic. The reduction of funding already from 30000 to 28000 a month doesn't cover staffing costs. With only three of the 17 residents occupying the cabins in November having been housed in the better options the council committed to, and kudos for staff for maintaining that standard for um, where people will move. Great, thank you. Sir, I'm just to five minutes, uh, so I'm just so gonna- that was five minutes? That's five minutes right Whoa. there. Uh, are there any questions from council? None? Thank you very much, sir. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, moving to our next delegation, we'll invite Jan English to appear before council again to speak to the sleeping cabin wind down plan. Good evening, Your Worship and Council Members. Thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Jan, and previous to this, my dog Jack and I lived on the street. But we moved into the cabin community, and we've been there for a couple months now, about almost three months. I was on the street for four years, and I've stayed in almost every possible place Kingston has that you can fit. Everywhere from the roof of Speedy Muffler, to tents, to shelters, with friends. Up until I found OLS, I can honestly say I don't, didn't once have a safe night's sleep or a full night's sleep. It doesn't matter where you are, you're, com you're 
constantly have to worry about your belongings, your safety, and who's around you. I realize that other shelters may be safe, but there is a lot to be said for locking your own door and having four walls around it with your belongings safely that will be found there when you wake up. The cabin community does that for me. I also save money because I can buy food, store it in my fridge, cook it in my cabin or in the community kitchen, and anytime I choose to eat it. There are many meals that you can access in Kingston, but they stop at 2 p.m. The next one is until 9 p.m. So if you miss lunch, you're in trouble. <laughs> Takeout is incredibly expensive, and the food bank only works if you have a fridge and a place to store it. The cabin community gives me that. There are very few places that you can go and shower, and the few that you can, you must sign on a list, and sometimes you wait up to two or three hours, and sometimes you don't get there at all. It doesn't work very well if you have a nine o'clock doctor's appointment. I can shower at the cabin community anytime, 24 seven. I don't have to sign a list. I just take my things in and if it takes me longer than 15 minutes, that's okay. I also can access a washroom 24 seven, which is a very much needed thing. When you're on the street, there is nowhere. That being said, what I'm trying to say is when people become homeless, they don't have the ability. It's more than just the shelter and a roof over your head and amenities. We need all of that, but we need respect and integrity. People treat you differently. They've labeled us and we've become less than them. We are not less than any one of you in here. We deserve the same treatment. We deserve normal living because it's what keeps you going. You need a light at the end of your tunnel or you can lose faith in everything and just fall apart. We come from all walks of life, educated. We all have different backgrounds. It could happen to anyone at any time. I lived in a good house with a nice family and I ended up out here because I became ill. There are many things that cause people to become homeless but it doesn't mean that we should be treated it as anything less. The cabin community basically saved me. When I found it, I was on my last leg and it has brought back some energy and some reason to keep looking and trying to find a home. There's staff there 24 seven that can give me referrals. They can give me any information I need and if they don't have it, they look it up and find it for you. The support is phenomenal and you need that support, you need the structure, and you need to have a solid place that you can come back to. And that's what it offers to us until we find better housing. Um, sometimes you just need someone to talk to, someone to listen, to keep you moving, to take your frustration out, and they do. I wonder what they do when they get home, who they talk to, because after listening to all of us all day, I'm sure they have a little frustration. The wind down period is a great idea, but until you have something better to offer us, I don't understand when this works, and it works so well, and as far as I can see, it's the only thing that works. All the other shelters don't offer what the cabin community does. We feel like whole people. We have a key to a lock and a door. 30 seconds. Okay. So I'm asking that during the wind down period, if we could just keep it, if we could keep the cabin community until there is something else to offer, until we have something better. Because without it, we all lose. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions from council? Okay, thank you very much. So I appreciate the, the passion that's in the room. Of course, my job as chair is to enforce the rules of decorum, and so I'm going to ask for no applause uh, in council chambers, but th thank you for, um, for abiding by that. Uh, my next delegation on our list is Michael Sayer, who will appear before council again to speak to the sleeping cabin wind down plan. Mayor Patterson and members of council, 
My name is Michael Sayer. I'm here to speak about the wind down plan for the sleeping pavilions and to ask that Council support the move to Centre 70 for the, start, for the summer. I'm a nearby resident in Portsmouth. I volunteer with Our Livable Solutions and I've had the opportunity to view the day to day operation of the community and the residents. An issue with the location of the cabins close to local neighbourhoods has been a, poten a potential effect of the, cabin, uh, of the cabin community on the neighbourhood. On behalf of our Livable Solutions, we've carried out a survey of neighbours in the houses, condominiums and apartments in the streets close to the sleeping cabins in Portsmouth Harbour. The survey also included some others who regularly walk through the neighbourhood. The survey petition asked Portsmouth residents whether they agreed that the sleeping cabins had little or no impact on the neighbourhood. Signatures of 25 contacts presented by Councillor Amos have attested to this effect. And this is consistent with my own observation as a nearby neighbour. This result is gratifying when compared to some of the original concerns of the Portsmouth community when the programme was established. The pilot programme has, has served a considerable number of homeless Kings, Kingstonians since 2022 without perturbing the neighbourhood. While it would not continue to do so under city funding, valuable lessons have been learned. Given that our Living Solutions and its many partners have an objective to continue the programme under alternative funding at a permanent location, the final move to Centre 70 deserves support so that the investment we've made already is not lost. My observation is that the model of closed community living devised by our livable solutions has benefits of transitional living for both residents and the surrounding neighbourhood. In the OLS model, residents are identified and selected for their ability to grow and contribute within the cabin community. They have the dignity of possessions and a personal space, a space they can retire or remit to or remain in when desired. However, they live within a facility which provides seven day, 24 hour support, active transportation to medical and other appointments, the development of fellowship and compatibility with peers, an overall sense of community responsibility, and not least, the staff, a staff that loves them. This is, this is more than is offered by a single apartment or institutional room, and is one that can deal with, with residents initially needing substantial help. Under these circumstances, it is each resident's interest to minimize external disturbances and incidents in the neighborhood. The survey suggests that this has happened in the Portsmouth cabin community. I think the, all, the OLS system encourages residents to mutually assist each other to transition back into society and enables the, the neighborhood to help in this objective. Kingston pioneered this concept. Kingston should be proud of the result, and I hope Kingston will facilitate its continuation in a permanent location. Moving to Centre 70 in the, for the summer should be supported. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if there are no questions, I'm going to ask uh, if there are any additional delegations to add. Councillor Toso. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. I have several others to add, if they could be put up on the board. Okay, so moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Ridge to add Anita Ragunathan. Okay, uh, and that's to speak to uh, affordable housing. Okay. okay, all those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Councillor Tozo? I've got another few to add on the board. Okay, moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Chinani, that uh, Don Raymond be allowed to speak again with respect to the affordable and supportive uh, housing updates and new projects. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried.
Okay, next move by Councillor Toza, seconded by Councillor Osanek, uh, that Ralph Thompson be allowed to speak to the sleeping cabin wind down plan. So, sir, not, not quite yet. I'll call you up. Uh, I'll call you up once we get there. Right now, we're just going through the procedure of just adding additional delegations. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, moved by Councillor Toza, second by Councillor Sanic to allow Chrissy Bedard to speak to the sleeping cabin wind down plan. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor Toza, seconded by Councillor Sanic that uh, to allow Deb Bogarts to speak to the sleeping cabin wind down plan. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Okay, moved by Councillor Toso, seconded by Councillor Sanic to allow Marsha Wiggins to speak to the sleeping cabin wind down plan. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, moved by Councillor Toza, seconded by Councillor Sanic to allow Alyssa Shaver to speak to the sleeping cabin wind down plan. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Moved by Councillor Toza, seconded by Councillor Sanic that we allow Joe Brasseur to speak to the sleeping cabin wind down plan. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Osanic to allow Crystal Wilson to speak to the sleeping cabin wind down plan. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Anybody else? Councillor Shenani? Yeah, I'd like to add Greg Samuel to uh, speak to uh, affordable housing, affordable and supportive housing updates and new projects. Okay. So moved by Councillor Nanny, seconded by Councillor Tozo to add Greg Samuel to speak to the affordable and support housing. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, last call. Okay. So with, uh, with that, we'll move into the additional delegations that have been added. Uh, so first, I'll invite Anita Ragunathan to speak to affordable and support housing projects and updates. Um, thank you, Councillor Ridge and Councillor Tozo for putting forward the motion to allow my delegation and to Council for approving it. My name is Anita Reganathan, and I'm a member of the Cataraqui Union of Tenants. I've been a tenant on and off for the last 17 years, which is what led me to advocate for shelter and housing justice. At KUT, we believe the only solution to housing and the housing and homelessness crisis is to treat housing as a public utility, not a vehicle for wealth accumulation. Governments at all levels speak of affordable housing, but when affordable is defined as 60, 80, or even sometimes 100% of an already deeply unaffordable market rate, the question becomes affordable for who? Because affordable housing units are indexed to market price, in actuality, they inflate rents, they price people out of the housing market, and they create more homelessness. Report number 24-055, an update on affordable and supportive housing in the city of Kingston, which is before you tonight, highlights nine ongoing so-called affordable housing projects, of which only 10 units are rent geared to income. When I asked Director of Housing and Social Services, Ruth Nordegraf, why this is the case, she replied that RGI units are expensive for the city to build and maintain. Three years ago, CAO, CAO Laney Hurdle told City Council that it cost approximately $100,000 to build one RGI unit, and now the city is spending $350,000 per non-RGI unit on the 1300 Princess Street block and $650,000 per what are essentially jail cells on the 484 Albert Street project. The cost of both projects amount to $56.5 million. 
At $100,000 per unit, the city could have built 564 RGI units. Even if the price of construction has doubled in the last three years, that's still 282 RGI units. Um, clearly, the cost is not the issue at hand. Priorities are. And right now, the priority of the city of Kingston, as outlined in this report, is large landlords and developers and not working class Kingstonians. While social housing is vilified and deemed too expensive by city and housing administrators in North America, 60% of people in Vienna, which is actually the most livable city in the world, live in social housing. At KUT, we're concerned by the fact that this report recommends selling city-owned properties to for and non-profit developers to build market housing. Instead, we need to support tenants who are priced out of market housing by retrofitting and building more and better public rent geared to income housing, which is the only solution to the housing affordability crisis. Additionally, in regards to transitional and supportive housing in Kingston, the punitive nature of these facilities is highly concerning and emphasizes the need for low barrier shelters and permanent housing to address homelessness. Last week at the Bell Park encampment, we spoke to a 15-year-old living in the woods who was banned from a home-based youth shelter for behavioral issues. This child has been on the street since the age of 11 and has faced unimaginable hardships leading to deep trauma, and yet is expected to act like a well-adjusted grown-up or lose their housing. The reality on the ground indicates to us that the housing and homelessness strategy is a complete failure, including the Rideau Heights regeneration strategy, which is simply the theft of public land and housing and a handover of it to large landlords and developers. The system is broken, and if the city of Kingston continues down the course of prioritizing these landlords and developers and terrorizing poor and unhoused Kingstonians, the consequence will be more poverty and more encampments. But it's not too late to change course. We urge council to reject report number 24-055 and direct staff to go back to the drawing board and develop a report that will focus on providing public rent geared to income housing for Kingstonians who have been made housing insecure and homeless by the policies in this report before you. The city must stop investing in market priced and privately owned for-profit housing and must stop privatizing and marketizing Kingston and Frontenac Housing Corporation. KUT demands a permanent moratorium on encampment evictions, the expansion of the ICH and shifting of existing trans transitional and supportive housing facilities into low barrier facilities with the focus on harm reduction, and the reconstruction of Kingston and Frontenac Housing Corporation into a municipal developer to build social housing. 30 seconds. Uh, we released a statement outlining these and other demands that we believe will improve the standard of living for all Kingstonians, which everyone can find on our website. I've also uh, left printed copies outside, and we really encourage council members and the public to read it and to work with us to provide housing for all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if, there are no, uh, if there are no other questions, th thank you. Okay, so just as a, a second piece, I'm just going to ask again that there be no applause from the audience, please. Um, next, we will invite Don Raymond to speak to council again with respect to uh, affordable and support housing updates and next steps. It's the first time I've been here, done this. All right. Good evening, Your Worship, members of council. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, we have, uh, I put mine on a slideshow, and I think I'm just gonna read it. Um, uh, is there a forward? Okay, thank you. My name is Don Raymond. Uh, we've been residents of Riedel Heights in Kingston for 34 years. My wife uh, Marlene and I, along with our neighbors and school teachers and school coaches and corner store owners, raised two daughters and all their friends. I wish to thank the city of Kingston for allowing me to speak here this evening. I would like to thank the authors of the report for the work they've done and the insight it brings into our understanding of the homeless and emergency here in Kingston. I expect this document will circulate beyond the usual local residents who are experiencing the same challenges to their most vulnerable as we are in Kingston. 
Over the past several years, and particularly the last six months, the issue of homelessness has grown, not just for me, but for many others who have deep concerns about the welfare of those in our community. Um, everything here is on the uh, is on the record. I might I might edit this a bit while I'm talking. Um, I have nothing negative to say about the findings or the methodology of the report. It's good work, and that should be said. In the report, I count roughly 230 beds as reported on Table 1, ongoing affordable housing projects. An additional maximum of 255 are available at some point in the future, Table 2. Uh, that's 485 beds. Half of those are hypothetical. They don't exist. They're, they're going to be here someday. Um, there are about 550 people who are homeless now. If the historical data on homelessness stays on this track, I don't see it ever getting caught up. Always behind. Many social media groups have uh, been created spontaneously. Here's where I'm going to edit. Mine's one of them. It's among a number of them. Um, there is great interest in uh, getting relevant, timely, and accurate information about this problem, about which we're all concerned. I'm doing these things on my own. I just go out and, well, we find out what we can on the internet, but sometimes it means walking into place like OLS and saying, what are you doing? Um, it's necessary. Uh, I have to go and, well, now I have to be here. Right? I wouldn't normally be here, but it's necessary. To begin with the obvious, the, house, the cost of housing is simply beyond the means of a growing percentage of the population in our country. This is a chart that depicts the changes in housing costs versus income from 1984 through 1922. You see it right there. A precipitous up tick. It maps on to the homeless data here in Kingston. It's the number of homeless individuals in Kingston from 2020 to 2024. Homelessness has increased 150% from that time. If unchecked, we're going to reach a thousand homeless in three years. I tried to find in my research. I tried to find information on deaths, mortality. Um, there is none. People die down there, and that's the last you heard of them. You may not even know that they die. There's no name. There's no cause of death. Um, they're just they're just gone. Closest I can get here are the counts of unnamed or unclaimed bodies. We can assume that they were homeless. And you can see the, the numbers there for Kingston in those two years. And I can't quite read it from here. 30 seconds. Yeah, what you said. Um, to cut to the chase, the precipitous increase in house prices and food while income has remained at 1990 levels, have driven people out of their homes and onto the street. The reasons for that are beyond the scope of this presentation. The impact is that those house prices are rising with no value for the investment. A house bought in 1990 is not four times better than in 2024. It's the same house and can be traded for another similar house. Great. To my mind, any profit is thank, you. Here. thank you, sir. Oh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause you there, but thank you very much. Uh, so we're just at five minutes. Uh, are there any questions from Council? Councilor Rich. Uh, thank you, Worship, and through you. Thank you very much for your presentation. You're is welcome. there a way that I can get a copy of your presentation? Yeah, the clerk's office. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I apologize. Well, I couldn't fit this in. My, my, I, I, I think I need a new prescription, uh, okay. but it was just a little well, difficult to read. So we'll I would like, I'd like tonight. to take the time to I read just it. Got mine tonight. We'll circulate. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank they're spectacular, literally. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. That's great. Okay, moving on to our next delegation this evening, we'll invite Ralph Thompson to speak to Council with respect to the sleeping cabin wind down plan.
Mayor Patterson, Council. Good evening. My name is Ralph Thompson, and I live in the Henderson Place neighborhood, just a few minutes' walk from Center 70. Some of my motorcycle friends and I have had coffee at the Bloom Skills Community Cafe in Center 70 for a few times a week for the last couple of years. And we park our bikes right beside the sleeping cabins. Our occasion, on occasion, several of the residents have come over to admire our bikes and have some very interesting motorcycle stories of their own to tell. From listening to the residents' stories, it seems that the sleeping cabins have been a very positive effect on our lives, getting them off the streets, getting them a chance to straighten out their lives and hope to integrate back into mainstream society. The local Henderson Place community, the two neighborhood churches, the businesses in the neighborhood, strip mall, and the school just across the street from the cabins have had no negative reactions to their presence in our community. And that is backed up by the many positive petition signatures from this area. In closing, with the sleeping cabins return to Center 70, please continue to support this endeavor that you have started and find a way to permanently house our future neighbors. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. There are no questions from council. We'll move on to Chrissy Bedard. We'll invite Chrissy Bedard to speak to council with respect to the sleeping cabin wind down program. Thank you, Your Worship, and all members of the Council for allowing me to speak tonight about the Sleeping Cabin Wind Down Plan. My name is Christine Bedard, and I am a care coordinator with our Livable Solutions Sleeping Cabins. I am here today on behalf of myself, as a woman with lived experience, on behalf of OLS residents, and on behalf of the hundreds of individuals currently, sorry, currently experiencing homelessness in the Kingston area. I was homeless for five years and lived in encampments all across Kingston. Bell Park, and the area now referred to as the Integrative Care Hub. This is where I first met Crystal Wilson and became involved with the movement for this cabin community. These conversations brought the idea of hope to myself and others that one day we might be off the streets. Since I began, began employment with OLS cabins, I have heard uh, degrading names used to describe this work from dog houses to sheds. These terms are thrown around by people who do not understand the work that has gone into this project. For the residents, the only appropriate terms for these cabins is home. Something as simple as having a key to a front door is something most of us take for granted. But for our residents, that everyday house key is a symbol of regaining control over their lives and moving forward out of homelessness. Both as a staff member, as a human, I am angry that we are once again fighting for the right for basic housing for every person. I'm angry that I am facing possible homelessness again due to lack of income with the program being scheduled to end, putting myself and my fellow colleagues out of work. The wind down plan has no support for staff, no employment resources to help us transition, and no um, recognition for the good work that staff have been doing for our residents and the Kingston community. I am frustrated with the inconsistencies and letdowns from those tasked with helping, but I know they are overburdened as, as well. Throughout the OLS sleeping cabins, many of our residents have not had housing first man, um, case managers to help um, with their housing search, to access supportive housing and to access city rent supplements. Despite that, this being part of the original promise, with 537 people on the list of those who need homes, people are left stranded waiting to receive assistance. To fill this gap, we do what we seem to always do. We rely on ourselves to assist our residents in their long-term housing search with limited resources. The city continues to publicize that the project was always temporary solution to support the unhoused during the COVID-19 pandemic. However, while the immediate fears of viruses have sustained, the homeless issue in the city has only continued to increase. We know our program works. We have seen success with clients developing new life skills that can only be developed once they are not fighting to survive day by day. In some cases, we have supported clients in finding long-term housing. 
I am concerned that the wind down plan does not properly protect cabin residents from returning to homelessness. Recent city statistics state that 112 people are sleeping rough, found sleeping rough, sorry, in the city of Kingston. These are, I have a petition signed by at least 162 people we found actually sleeping rough in the streets of Kingston. Um, they have assisted to, they have um, assisted to doing, to doing their best to survive within city of Kingston boundaries. In speaking with our fellow citizens, it, is, it was easy to see the desire to remove their individual encampments in exchange for one of our safe, secure, and supportive of housing com, uh, cabin community. The current wind down plan indicates that when residents move to better, op, uh, um, sorry, better options, the cabin should be removed for, you, for use. I feel this is unreasonable. When people are stuck outside in the rain and the cold, even a day or a week in a cabin will help to give a small reprieve from homelessness. Since the cabins have been have been staffed the same since the cabins have been staffed the same whether there are 17 residents or two let's not waste valuable resources and instead of allowing the cabins to be used until the program is indeed closed we need to keep giving hope to people st um, people still stuck outside this wind down plan and closing of the sleeping cabins does the opposite 30 thank seconds you. Oh. thank you for your consideration great thank you very much if there are no questions from council, we'll move on to our next declaration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, you can give that to the clerk. That is perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, next we'll invite uh, Deb Bogarts to speak to council again with respect to the sleeping cabin wind down program. Ms. Bogarts. Thank you, Your Worship, and all members of the Council for allowing me to read this letter from a resident of the Sleeping Cabin Program in response to the Sleeping Cabin Wind Down Plan. My name is Deborah Bogarts. The resident wanted to present this important information themselves, but found this environment to be too overwhelming. Cabin living is the concept of helping the personal recovery process and also the exigencies of unaffordable housing. There are many tiny home communities here in Ontario, throughout Canada, United States, Europe, and elsewhere. All have had the same initial reaction from neighbors, police, city council, etc. They were concerned with home devaluation, human waste, garbage, crime, noise. However, what was found was lower crime, cleaner surroundings, neighborhood community, and friendship. If cities feel these cabin homes are unsightly, especially tourist destination communities, is having tents in parks and people begging on the streets and sleeping on the streets less unsightly? There are different types of homelessness. There are hardcore drug and alcohol addicts and those who suffer debilitating mental illness, perhaps someone in your own family. There are those, however, who only need structure, supports, and programs to become self-supporting. The cabin community allows for everyone to slowly and steadily grow. Home is more than a physical structure. It is physical, mental, and emotional stability. There are also many low-income seniors who are being affected with the specter of homelessness. The Mental Health Commission of Canada stated that seniors will be the group that experiences the highest rate of mental illness in Canada by 2041. From senior abuse to mental health decline due to shame and depression, these past years are the first time 20% of middle income seniors are facing poverty, choosing to pay their mortgage or eat. And a quarter of renting seniors cut back on groceries for their rent. But the most shocking numbers from the home first, from home first, are that 60% of seniors are more likely than a younger person to experience chronic homelessness once they lose their housing. I myself, as a productive retired senior, am on a four year long wait list for rent geared to income housing in Kingston and surrounds. 
My concern with the wind down plan is that support to prevent residents from sliding backwards into homelessness is vague. Options equivalent or better than the cabin community have not been offered to me. Before joining the cabin community, I did, I did search for nine months for suitable living options, but ended up having to live in my vehicle. Overpriced accommodations create fear. Returning to homelessness is my greatest fear. Without the cabins, I will be back to showering at a local pool, using public bathrooms to wash up in the morning and evening, and sleeping in the Walmart parking lot in my vehicle at 68 years old. To have a home environment again was a sanctuary, a place to connect to and, a rela and relax in a deep sense of mental ease. People in transition from street to house should not feel like a burden. No one was born to live on the streets. I do not want to live in my vehicle again. Few people can say they are immune to the circumstances unhoused people went through to find themselves outcasts. Everyone in the cabins knows this is a launching pad and their goal is to work towards independence. Please ask for a more robust wind down plan which better protects residents from sliding back into homelessness. We can float more boats if everyone has a sail. This concludes the letter you're on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, next we will invite um, Marsha Wiggins to speak to Council with respect to the Sleeping Cabin Wind Down Program. Hi, um, I'm a resident, uh, Marcia Wiggins. I've spoke here before. Um, this is the only transitional housing type thing that is invited to, like all the other places. They allow either females or males, or you got to be a certain, like you know, they got one for natives and vets. It's the only one for couples. So if you're a couple you'd have nowhere really to go that's transitional housing or stay at certain shelters and that's not a very good place to be staying as a couple. Uh, the cabins kind of works out as a community where everybody gets to know each other. There's a lot of people that don't trust. When they've been homeless for so long, they have a hard time trusting anyone. You build a trust because you get to know your neighbors, you get to know the staff, you build a trust. Taking down the wind down and having them go to a whole new area where they don't know anybody, and especially some of them that are a little untrusting of people, you don't know what their personalities are like. Um, there's sometimes they may have certain outbursts through PTSD. If you, if you know them well, you know how to help them through it. If you don't, you're gonna think that they're a crazy individual, they got tempers, and they're gonna end up getting kicked out and no place to go, stuck in the woods, and that will make them even worse. They can regulate their medications. Um, staff will help them if they remind them, give them their medications if they need to, which is, very good for a lot of them because it does calm them down and it does help them through it. Um, a permanent site, it would make things a lot more burden for everybody too. Having it move back and forth, it, it takes a lot, of, it's stressful and takes a lot out of trying to find housing, trying to get your life organized, trying to set everything up, it, it would be, a lot more homier. It wouldn't look like a bunch of sheds. It would look like a bunch of homes in a community. You know, we could have flowers, make it look nice. There hasn't been any issues. Nobody has had any issues with us. Um, we, you, you wouldn't have to worry about thief-free problems or anything like that. Everybody, 
when people are warm in a home where they can lock it up, the last thing they're going to think about is go rob somebody. No, they want to stay in there. Uh, there's Wi-Fi, TV, they can enjoy life again. They can relax. Um, I love cooking, and a lot of them don't really like cooking. So they give me food, and I don't mind cooking for them, cook for the whole, everybody, which was a little hard to get used to, 17 people cooking for, but uh, yeah, you get used to it after a while. And everybody is um, really, really friendly. You can go to the staff for any kind of help, any kind of issue. You're, you're not, there's no shame or an embarrassment and you don't feel like you have to hide from society. There's quite a bit of seniors that do need help. Those are the ones I think they're in worse need for help because there's, they can't do the shelters. A lot of them, they can't do transitional housing because they can't do it on their own. They need, they need help. Like some of them need help getting up or, you know, um, help learning how to cook. There's all kinds of things that everybody can teach everybody. Everybody has a skill. They teach everybody a little bit of everything. There's no stipulation on, eight, well, you got to be over 25, I believe, but you can be, you know, 100 and still go there. 30 seconds. Um, I, I used to be judgmental, too. When uh, I owned a house, I had a house, and I used to be judgmental. It wasn't until I became homeless I realized, you know what? I don't know why I was being so judgmental, because there's no difference between me and them. Everybody has a story, and it, unfortunately, we get the crappy end of the deal sometimes, you know? Life sometimes doesn't give you lemons. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, if there's no questions, we'll move on to our next speaker is Alyssa Shaver who will all speak to council with respect to the sleeping cabin wind down program. Can you hear me? Sorry. Um, my name is Alyssa Shaver. Um, thank you for letting me speak. Um, I'm a teacher and I coach the, like I head coach the Queens University like varsity cheerleading team and things like that. So I'm a member of the community um, and I really like volunteering and I didn't have enough on my plate. So I wanted to volunteer and I reached out to a bunch of places and OLS was the first one to take me in right away and say, we've got some stuff for you to do. Um, so I've started teaching a resident to read and that quickly turned into getting online courses so that they're more employable. Um, and now we're up to the point where we are uh, finishing high school credits to get a more meaningful employment. And like that came with a lot of conversations and things like that too. Um, first, I'd like to apologize if my language is not as professional as you're used to. I'm mainly used to talking to small children. This is not my forte. This is not why I started volunteering. Um, a bunch of us don't know the formalities, um, but I'm so willing to adapt. I know that this is necessary. Um, I too had reservations. I had a fear of the unknown. I had no idea what to expect when I walked into the sleeping cabins. I didn't, I, I had no idea and I was a little bit nervous. Um, I listened to the last council meeting as well and that was really painful to, to listen to. Um, people calling, people being really upset about um, big emergencies that happened, um, people being upset about the small sizes of the sheds that they're living in. It, it's just an apparent, it's a lack of observed and demonstrated evidence. Um, when the data was collected, there's a lot of evidence about there, there's a lot of evidence out there about how sleeping cabins, there's no real data that they work. Um, they haven't been around for very long, so that's why there's no data and maybe the data we're collecting isn't the right stuff. Anyways, um, for people who don't know, just to elaborate a little bit on what other people have said, the sleeping cabins are very clean, it's very welcoming, and yes, everybody helps out and things like that, but something really special about it is that the residents are encouraged to rediscover their independence and who they are again. It's not just about them cooking their own stuff and them keeping a tidy home and things like that. It's um, discovering what they like and things like that. Um, because there's a weird phenomenon where because they're separate and they're not forced to interact, like in little apartments and things like that, they go out of their way 
to get to know your neighbors and it feels like you're getting to know your neighbors, you're not being forced to live with so-and-so who's right next door. It's a little bit like regular life again, which hopefully they can get more used to. Um, the cabins are different than any other supportive transitional housing options and that is why small communities have been successful. Um, it's like the small schools versus large schools. They still work, it's just not as well. Um, it's like small classes and large class sizes. Having your own living space feels much different than living in an apartment complex with many others gives a better feeling um, of much needed space to grow and really thrive, not just exist. This is a good program, this is a necessary program, and what works for some is beneficial for all. Um, going back to how politics are required for change, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, all the councillors and things like that, because what you do takes special humans to do it, not all of us have the patience for it. Um, the administration and policies regarding the cabins is a navigational nightmare, and OLS is pushing through regardless because it is the right thing to do. Um, the all oh, sorry. the all-encompassing view of all the moving parts is a perspective more people need to have. In order to make decisions about other people's lives, they need to not only be listened to, but patiently communicated with, while keeping all the cultural differences a priority, because there are cultural differences. What you may think is good enough for somebody, or what you may think is not good enough for somebody, it actually is, and they, they'd be very, very willing to have that thing. Um, Politics. There's recommendations at the bottom of a document, Report 24-052, with regards to the wind down. I think there's seven, they're not numbered, but in my brain I numbered them. And the fourth one is something about how if a deadline approaches, I just wanted to speak to that one, um, should the deadline approach and an agreement is close to them finding a permanent location, I would just ask that we consider making an amendment to allow them to do this and give them a little bit more time if it seems we can develop thresholds and things like that. You guys can, I know that I'm not supposed to do recommendations, I know that. Um, but the reasoning, if, if that isn't possible, then the reasoning for a hard cutoff needs to be communicated well, and it needs to be a good one. 30 seconds. Um, and the last one, I'm coming up to the very first recommendation, which is to wind down. Um, I ask that you are more open-minded with regards, with regards to the cultural differences and take a wider perspective, because again, this is a good program, this is a necessary program, and what works for some is beneficial for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, if there are no other questions, we'll move on. Uh, our next speaker is Joe Brasseur. I uh, will invite uh, Joe Brasseur to speak to Council if he's here. Okay, not here. Okay, okay. Uh, next we'll invite uh, Crystal Wilson to speak to Council again with respect to the sleeping cabin wind down plan. Will it do anything if I put this on there? Thank you, Your Worship, and members of council for allowing me to speak tonight. <clears throat> I, I honestly don't like being up here, and I feel like I've been here way too much. Um, I'm here to speak about the sleeping cabin wind down plan. And um, what you've heard already tonight, we, you know, at our liberal solutions, we encourage our residents and we encourage our staff to use their voice and express their opinion and help us shape our program, help us shape our response to challenges, help us shape our response to barriers. Um, when we evaluated the wind down plan that was provided to us with our residents and with our staff, we were very disappointed and we had asked for provisions for staff in the wind down plan. We were very disappointed that there's no provisions for staff in the wind down plan. OLS uses a model to hire lived experience. So not only are we helping 17 people in cabins, we're also helping 10 staff who might otherwise not be employed. We helped eight. Currently, eight of our staff um, were on social assistance before they came to the sleeping cabins. They're excellent, excellent employees who are working really well with us. I was thrilled when I got a chance to hire Chrissy because she was so instrumental in getting the cabins off the ground when we first um, developed the, the idea at Bell Park. And she, in fact, designed this t-shirt back at Bell Park Days. Um, so our concern is that the wind down of this program will also put eight people at risk of homelessness to have alternate incomes that will support them, but two, eight of our, our staff are at risk of homelessness. 
Um, and so we're concerned that there's no provisions in the plan to help them. We don't get funding that supports being able to hire HR specialists and, and you know, employment specialists and stuff, so we need some help with that. Um, as well, um, our residents have not been provided with anything that they feel is better than the alternative. We have tried, we have asked questions, we have asked for options. We have tried to fight for rent supplements and were declined because my, my understanding is that maybe the motion in, in November was a little bit done a little bit hastily and didn't give staff the power to do what we needed to do to get people housed from November, um, it is my impression. Um, but <laughs> the, the options that are available, the options that people got some brochures about, they didn't help move people forward or even sideways. Our residents have made it clear they're not interested in sliding backwards. They understand the good work they've been doing with us. They understand the accomplishments they've made. They understand the progress they've made towards independence with um, the sleeping cabin program. And our very strong concern is the wind down plan as presented will slide them all back into homelessness. Um, there was a study developed. It's really hard. I'm as a mathematician, I'm always looking for data and numbers and trying to piece everything together. And, and it's really hard to get data about homelessness. I wrote to the Auditor General about this back before the cabins ever existed. Um, and you know, as a whole um, government entity, we do not do a good job collecting data about homelessness and the cost of homelessness. But there was a study done in 2016 by At Home, At Home Chez Soi, which indicated that in Canada, the cost of homelessness per year is $53,000. Those are, that, so that's the cost to leave somebody on the street. Um, that was 2016 numbers. I used the Bank of Canada inflation calculator to turn that into 2024 numbers, so that's about $66,000. So my concern with this wind down plan, the way it's been presented, is that with 17 residents and the eight staff at risk of homelessness, you're actually going to cost the taxpayers $1.6 million by allowing these people to slide back into homelessness. And I think, you know, these are real numbers that we should be doing a better job tracking. I tried to figure out you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at looking at numbers and reports and figuring things out, and I could not figure out from City of Kingston reports what the actual cost of homelessness is in the City of Kingston. I hope that we, you know, work to doing a better job of, of um, figuring out these numbers so that we can have accurate data to make good comparisons. So, you know, the, if the cost of moving 25 people into homelessness is $1.6 million, that comes nowhere near the cost of the, what, it, what it takes to run the sleeping cabin program. So I hope that you consider this, but I hope that you reconsider the wind down plan as a whole. I don't think it's robust enough to protect our residents. Um, we've been told, you know, we heard there's better options. We've been, we've heard that our residents won't be at risk of homelessness, but we haven't seen that evidence. And the, and the wind down plan doesn't protect them from, from, from that risk. 30 seconds. Um, I also, in your amendment, um, and this is, I apologize because this was last minute, but we were working hard trying to find a permanent location, trying to find ways to move this program forward because our residents have told us, the people who are stuck outside have told us, the 160 plus people who are sleeping rough right now, when we presented them in a petition, we said, you know, would you give up your encampment? Almost everybody behind the integrated care hub have signed that petition, which was given to you that said they would give up their encampment for a cabin. I think this should be considered. Okay, um, thank you. I think I'll, I'll just pause you there. Okay. That's okay. Uh, are there any questions from council? Uh, if not, then we will continue on. Thank you very much. Okay, we have one final delegation this evening. We will invite uh, Greg Samuel to speak to council again with respect to affordable and support housing updates and next steps. Be brief. Uh, so, uh, the report on affordable and supportive housing references uh, the 10 year municipal housing and homelessness plan. Uh, the plan was to build uh, 1,700 units of affordable housing. The plan was to end homelessness and move individuals with complex needs into permanent supportive housing. So, uh, I'm nervous, so I'm just gonna skip to you. Uh, by year 10, which was last year, 80% uh, of former chronically homeless individuals will be housed. 
this is by now. There will be a 50% reduction in shelter bid nights from 2013 levels. The average length of stay in shelters will be reduced to seven days. No one will be homeless for longer than 30 days. So, now I guess I realize lots of change, tons of stuff has changed, but uh, somehow uh, this should still happen. I, I don't have... <laughs> A unit apparently costs three hundred thousand dollars. So even if you get ten million bucks, uh, you've got to house five hundred people plus people in core severe core housing need, which is I don't know my red report. There's a thousand people. Uh, so three hundred thousand times I don't know what the math is. It's a huge number. At the very least. At the very least, let's set up a campsite, a, a public campsite. Anybody can put up a tent, and you have services. You have electricity. You have showers. Just at the very bottom, allow anyone to set up a tent or whatever. And I don't know. That's it. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much, sir. So that takes us to the end of our delegations this evening. Uh, we have no briefings. Or, uh, we did receive the one petition uh, from the earlier delegation. Are there any other petitions to present? Uh, yes, Deputy Mayor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Through you, I'd like to present a petition that has 170, 117 signatures on it. Um, the sleeping cabins at Portsmouth Olymp uh, Portsmouth Harbour operate by Our Livable Solutions have provided safe, supportive shelter for homeless individuals for three winter seasons, given an objective to continue the community on a uh, suitable permanent location. As a resident in the neighbourhood of Portsmouth Harbour, the un undersigned attest that the cabin community and its residents have had little or no impact on the surrounding neighbourhood. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Stephen. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. I have a similar petition, but from uh, the area around Centre 70, where the sleeping cabins have been for two summers. Um, in short, uh, this is signed by, I believe it was around, I think it was 117 people uh, that have attested that as a resident in the neighbourhood of Centre 70, the undersigned attests that the cabin community and its residents have had little or no impact on the surrounding neighbourhood. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, if there's no other to pe petitions to present, we will continue on. We have um, one motion of condolence, moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Shays, that the sincere condolences of Kingston City Council be extended to the family and friends of former Councillor David Mears, who passed away on April 5th, 2024. Dave was a dedicated politician who served for 12 years as a city councillor, working to create positive change within the community. Our thoughts are with his family during this difficult time. All those in favour? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, we have no deferred motions, so we'll move on to reports. Uh, first, we have report number 42 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Stephen, seconded by Deputy Mayor Amos, that report 42 from the CAO consent be received and adopted. Uh, so there are four clauses. Would anyone like any of those clauses dealt with separately? Oh, yes. So we need to separate clause two for pecuniary interest, which we will do. Uh, Councillor Rich. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. I'd like to separate uh, Clause 3, the neighborhood area speed limit reductions. Okay, uh, so first we'll vote on uh, Clause 1 and 4. So Clause 1, opportunities to support vertical farming in Kingston. Clause 4, 2024 final tax levy and tax rates. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, Clause 2, Heart Center Service Level Agreement. Councillor Senek. 
Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I just want to thank staff very much for getting this um, service level agreement uh, completed. Um, Hart is so appreciative. Um, I know that this means a lot to them, and uh, they were hoping it would come to this for the past few years. I know it's very, very busy with all the priorities that staff have, and thank you for getting the service level agreement. Thank you. Okay, we'll call the vote on Clause 2. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Clause 3, Neighborhood Area Speed Limit Reductions. Councilor Ridge. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. So looking at the diagram, I'm just trying to find the right page because I was flipping through it. Um, so there's, there's a, a large section crosshatched labeled Phase 1 subject to further review, which happens to be the entire southern half of Kingstown. So I was just wondering if staff could expand upon that. I know that there's a recommendation for a report to come back in quarter four, and that there are six unique neighborhoods identified there. Um, uh, can they just briefly expand upon that paragraph in the report? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Subble. Uh, thank you, and through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes, yeah, so um, as you can see in, in the map, so. Um, there many of the neighborhoods that would have the speed the reduced speed limit attached to them are are self-contained or bounded by um, uh, arterial or collector roadways around them uh, the the area that we've shown in that hatched for further study is is the more historic uh, neighborhood in the city um, it has a lot of intersecting streets it's part of the grid it's it's part of the you know, the, the grid network that makes up the character of that neighborhood. It also means there's a lot of streets that would be connecting into and out of those typical, those collector, collectors or arterials that would be um, signed as the gateway into the neighborhoods. So we need to take a, a closer look at the way that we would implement the reduced speed limits, but the intention is the same. Um, speed limits in those areas would be reduced to 40 kilometers an hour and, and school areas reduced down to 30 kilometers an hour. And we bring details back about the recommended implementation that would apply to that entire area. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so just uh, a couple points. Uh, uh, so would that also, because of the the historical nature of that, the number of parks and school spaces within, the, for example, the McBurney Park area, which I received a lot of questions from constituents about, would there be a consideration of potentially having 30 kilometers per hour as the base speed limit, uh, given the density of uh, public uh, park space and schools? Mr. Simple. Um, through, through your worship, we're the, the approach that we're taking is is to reduce the the neighborhood speed limits to 40 kilometers an hour and then the 30 kilometers an hour would be applied in the school areas i don't expect that we would be seeking a further reduction beyond that there there may be recommendations that come up as part of our study and that could form the the re, that could be part of the report that comes back but at this point we would expect those those streets to be at uh, uh 40 kilometers per hour Okay, thank you. Uh, just just a few more questions, Mr. Semple. Thank you so much for your answers. Um, so when we're talking about the school zones too, um, because I noted that uh, there are several schools that in that area that are in that area that's designated for subject to further review. Um, will the schools such as Mulberry Street uh, or Mulberry School on Markland John Street and Central Public School on Sydney Street? Will those be given the same designation with the 30 kilometer per hour uh, speed limit uh, because they are school zones? Uh, but also, I'm just asking because they're in that that area for further study. Uh, thank you for your question, uh, through your, your worship. So um, the school areas we we have already applied um, the 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 community safety zones. Um, in in all of the school areas, including those schools. So areas that are the community safety zones with the associated with the school areas, those are the ones that would um, that would be reduced to thirty kilometers an hour, and it includes those schools. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Through you. Um, Mr. Semple, I had a quick question for you, and it's in regards to Portsmouth District, and you have an area that is considered phase two. 
uh, in in that district or in my district. Um, the area that is considered phase two, there is Centennial Public School that is really right across the road, St. Lawrence College, which is really right across the road. And we have, I have students that are constantly going back and forth on uh, Portsmouth and Johnson, uh, utilizing those, uh, those roadways to get to their schools. Um, is there any way that you can review this uh, so that a phase two area can be moved to a phase one consideration? Uh, thank you for your question and through you, um, Mr. Mayor. So the part of the rationale for the phase one um, um, uh, approach that we're taking here is it's linked to some federal funding that the city applied for and was granted. Um, that funding has a, a timeline attached to it that we have to spend, we have to implement these zones in by a certain point for us to be able to access that funding. Um, and these are the phase one zones are the zones that are um, uh, eligible to, to have that funding applied to it. So we certainly would work to implement phase two as quickly as we can after that as well, but we need to we need to make sure that we are taking advantage of those funding opportunities as well that that um, that this program is is eligible for. So this area that I'm referencing is not eligible as a phase one consideration because of the funding criteria. Yeah, linked to the way that you, uh, through your Mr. Mayor, yes, linked to the way that um, our application was formed. Uh, so because the schools are bounded by those those larger streets that I sort of referenced in my response to Councillor Ridge, so um, Johnson Street and others, where the where the speed limit would remain the same, not be reduced. Um, those are the bounds that that dictate that eligibility. I understand. I'm just. It's a question of concern when I have two, one f really large school and and one elementary school that literally is meters away from very busy roads and because of a funding criteria we're not eligible um i have concerns and i'll leave it at that okay uh council chiefs thank you um my question is in regards to the review of the community safety zones which i believe is in phase three i'm just wondering will the review of the community safety zones include areas without schools but have daycares, school bus stops, parks, senior homes, or school crossings? So um, as part, through you, Mr. Mayor, and just so I can, I just maybe need to clarify your question, Councillor Shaves. You're talking about the criteria for the community safety zones that are in place now or for future community safety zones? Well, I believe the criteria now for the current ones have schools around them. So I believe the criteria currently does not relate to any of the areas which I mentioned, because I have a couple of neighborhoods which don't have schools, but they have everything I just mentioned, which is a concern for those who have mobility issues, either they're too young or too old, or uh, other issues, and, and you have kids running in parks and maybe chase a ball out into the street, so I, I, or just waiting for the school bus, so. I've been through you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the clarification, Councillor Shaves. Yes, those are the those are are any those are some of the criteria that we could look at um, in sort of the future um, uh, community safety zone review that we do. Um, for I guess for information, when the initial phase of the community safety zones um, were implemented related to um, the school safety recommendations, so we finished the the eighty or so. Um, uh, zones layering them in around the school areas uh, that that uh, community safety zones can be added in other areas and we'd work to sort of review and set those criteria and those those um, site specific um, pieces are, are certainly pieces that would be considered in that okay thank you and I appreciate the, the review and the consideration okay Councillor Tozo Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. A uh, quick question is about signage. I am very happy to see both Kings Court and Rideau Heights in phase one. Amazing. Um, but I want to make sure that there's appropriate signage when people enter into the neighborhoods. Uh, would they be placed on sort of major arterial roads going into these neighborhoods, or what would that look like um, when phase one is implemented? 
Uh, thank, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, um, Councillor Tozo, the implementation will 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 look very similar or the same as to the pilot areas um, in Strathcona Park and in Westwoods. So the 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 speed limit reduction happens on on the gateway streets as you're coming in. So um, any of those areas, as you turn off the, the major roadway in uh, into the neighborhood, any of those entry points would have the the community the the speed limit uh, gateway speed limit signs uh, installed. So, for example, Conacher, Weller, Kings Court, Alfred Street, that would probably be what that would look like. Uh, uh, through you, Mr. Yes. So as, as an example, I guess if you were, as you were turning off of Division Street onto um, any of those streets, you would see that um, delineation. Yes. You'd see the speed limit sign change. Thank you. I have another follow-up question. So with community safety zones, the just speed limit is being dropped to 30 along with automatic um, speeding cameras. So the cameras would then find any car that went over 30 kilometers an hour. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Yeah, so, in the school areas um, where where the speed limit was reduced to thirty kilometers an hour, if uh, if a, um, a, a automated speed enforcement uh, camera was in place, it would look for cars that were traveling above thirty kilometers. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, uh, I guess this question is to Director Simple as well. So in, in conjunction with the automated speed enforcement cameras, um, a lot of the concerns that we hear in outside of school zones and residential neighborhoods is that people don't follow the speed limits as they're posted currently right now. So although I'm supportive of this program, the concerns I have is we're going to post more signs reducing the speed limits, and that's just going to increase the frustration of people. So is there some type of... Um, like police consultation that's happening uh, when these go into play to kind of increase enforcement and to raise awareness of the public that this enforcement effort will be in place to basically try to reshape the behavior that's happening out there so that we don't just get inundated with emails that we've lowered the speed limits, but we're not actually enforcing them. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, uh, Councillor Brown, uh, thank you for your question. So the Yes, I understand the concern, and I think one of the benefits of the neighborhood speed limit reductions is that it it is it allows to set the sort of tone of the speed limit for that neighborhood versus sort of street by street changes, which which is largely what our neighborhoods look like now, right? So some some streets set at forty, other streets set at fifty, um, and so we're looking to provide that sort of uniform expectation that the speed limit in the residential neighborhoods is now 40 kilometers an hour unless you're in a school area. Um, it, it's one of the tools that we're using in combination with automated speed enforcement, but also our traffic calming measures, um, some of the other pieces that we've been layering in um, around the active routes to school and the school safety program. And that includes discussion and consultation um, uh, with, with Kingston Police about how that can be enforced. Um, some, of that, some of that enforcement I think associated with this program would look very much the same as what we do with any of our speed limit changes. So we would identify those um, those changes to the police. If we're hearing concerns um, about a particular neighborhood or a particular street, we share that and then and then work with them on ways that um, information that they need to be able to enforce that. Okay, thank you for that answer. So beyond just having police enforcing it because they can't be everywhere, outside of these school zones, is there an opportunity for the city to actually use some automated speed enforcement in those areas? Like for instance, if we lower it to 40 kilometers an hour and just nobody's slowing down and it becomes, you know, just a big issue, is there an opportunity to have a couple of mobile speed enforcement cameras or, or have them on a rotational basis outside of school zones? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, in with the pilot program that that um, well that, that is part of the information report that's later on the agenda, the city will have two mobile um, automated speed enforcement cameras. But those those cameras will be going into the community safety zones, and at present, those are all linked with the school areas. So. So no, we wouldn't we wouldn't be using those cameras outside of the school areas in the uh, in the initial the pilot. But there would be nothing preventing that in the future, correct? 
Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, the one of the stipulations in, with the automated speed enforcement program is that they they need to be used within a community safety zone. So we would need to designate an area as a community safety zone, and then the the uh, speed enforcement cameras can be used within that. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Sanek. Um, thank you, Your Worship. I just wanted to let Director Sempo know that um, this is a really popular program. Um, as soon as we put the um, pilot project up in Westwoods, I had the other areas also asking me, when can we get them? And Elmwood and both Ridgewood Estates, like just recently in the last couple of weeks, have also said when. So thanks for this report, because now we can send it out with the map, and everyone knows when it's going to be rolling into their neighborhood. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Glenn. Uh, thank you, and through you. Uh, thank you, Director Semple. I, I do agree with Councillor Sanek's comments about this uh, being a, a good initiative, and I'm glad to see it moving forward. My question has to do with um, education. So this is going to be a big change for a number of people, and are there going to be education efforts, not just for drivers, but also for pedestrians? Um, you know, my concern with pedestrians uh, is also ensuring that they understand um, how to properly cross the road. Um, I tend to be very careful when I'm driving. However, when people don't cross right at the corner, um, and I think you're going to find this as you look downtown in this university district, um, people stepping off uh, when you least expect it when you're doing your best to avoid them. So just any comments on education efforts, please. Uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So as as part of the rollout of this program, and it would be uh, similar to how the pilot programs were rolled out, um, we'll be using, um, you know, we'll be, we'll be having our social media campaigns, digital marketing. We share information with the schools. Um, so education packages and information goes to the schools, geared to, to the students and to the parents. Um, we post all of that information on, on, certainly on our website, of course, but then we also do some roadside uh, messaging. We found with the you know, in in the pilot areas, certainly, certainly, while the signs were going up, there were a lot of questions about where the signs were going and the placement and what the signs were for. Um, but a really good understanding of what the program was um, when that information was available. As as it relates to you know, I think overall um, education, we are um, this year we're we're doing education work on the pedestrian crossovers or the PXOs. So there is an education campaign that's that's work, that started with that. We also work closely with the schools on active active route to school and school safety pieces and gear some of those to sort of different times of the year. So back to school, um, fall changes, changes in and around weather. And certainly, you know, um, being a responsible um, um, motorist, being a responsible cyclist, being a responsible pedestrian is is all part of um, all part of those sort of education pieces. Okay, thank you. That's good to hear. And there seems to be a large focus on school children, which is excellent. But as we move forward, I hope that we also uh, endeavor to make sure that the adult population is aware. Um, they set the example for children, so uh, getting to them is going to be equally as important. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Schnelli. Uh Thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's nice to see that we got some funding for this. I um, just want to know, I think I probably know the answer. Um, since we got the funding, does that mean this has been accelerated and we'll be able to get through these much quicker than if we didn't have the funding? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so um, I think we're, we would work to, um, we are using the funding um, for for staffing um, the, the design work, but but then also all of the materials. There are, there are hundreds of signs associated with this, so um, it, that's on top of all of the regular signage and other pieces that the city works on each year. Um, so we certainly are would work to expedite it. Um, the funding is is being used to 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 fund the bulk of the. Um, 
of the the signage, but also um, as part of it, there's driver feedback signs, so those speed feedback signs, and and um, on road painting and other elements that are being added. Um, but I, I certainly, you know, I hear your point and I take your a point from the other councillors as well, but the the desire for this to um, be implemented implemented as as quickly and as smoothly as possible, um, and we we will do that. Um, but we also want to make sure that we take advantage of of the funding we have available to us, um, so that we can spread those um, those tools um, and implementation uh, as across as much of the city as possible. Thank you very much, uh, through um, It's great to see this happening now. Um, I love this. Okay, we will call the vote on clause three. All those in favor, opposed, and that's carried. Okay, moving on to report number 43, 43 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Shea, seconded by Councillor Ridge, that report 43 from the CAO recommend be received and adopted clause by clause. Okay, the first clause, affordable and supportive housing updates and new projects. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, clause two. Oh, yeah. Sorry, my mistake, folks. So I had forgotten that um, in the adids it was a separate. So clause three is making an addition to clause one, and we hadn't just revised it. So, um, so first we'll deal with clause three. Um, and then we'll deal with clause two. Is that, do I have that right, Madam Clerk? Okay, so, so what we're gonna do first with clause three, we're going is a clause that would amend clause two. Is everyone clear on that? It basically would be adding an additional paragraph into the recommendation of clause two. Everyone's okay, okay. Um, any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, so now we'll go to clause two. Clause two is the sleeping cabin wind down plan now as amended with that additional clause that we've just approved. Councilor Rich. Thank you, uh, Your Worship, and through you. I'm just, uh, I'm just curious about uh, the, so uh, I just, would just like, a, with regards to this report, um, just an update from staff with regards to how the transition piece is going. Is that okay? Ms. Nordegraf. Uh, thank you. Uh, through you, uh, Mayor Patterson. Um, so after the November um, council direction, uh, staff have been um, obviously meeting as identified in the report with OLS, um, uh, both um, like bi-weekly meetings with staff, also with the boards. I think in the report it has conveyed kind of the this discussion. Um, we looked at both the case management approach and how to best support clients. And I don't think you have been seeing our approach in the reports. We also looked at how to best um, uh, look at the um, sleeping cabins um, moving forward, either um, a, a, a sale of the cabins and reinvestment in the funds, or as you've seen in the report as well, uh, a potential of um, the sale of those cabins for a very nominal fee to OLS. Um, again, I think we've really tried to, in the spirit of council's direction, work at a wind down plan, recognizing that it will be um, an intense project and process with all of our transitional housing providers that will need to be involved and have agreed to support this as well. Uh, and obviously a close collaboration with OLS um, to, to work through options for clients. I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you very much. Okay, Council Glenn. Uh, thank you and through you. So uh, just a couple of quick questions, I hope. Um, what do you think the feasibility is of the timeline that we've mapped out so far? I understand that this is very challenging and I'm very encouraged by the case management approach because I think that it's one that will be far more productive in terms of uh, accomplishing the goals we're all, all hoping to achieve. So a little bit on that timeline. 
Um, thank you. Through you, Mayor Patterson, I um, I agree that we all, I mean, we we hear this day in, day out, that housing and finding housing is challenging. Um, we do um, know that of the 17 cabin uh, residents, um, all of them have a housing first uh, case manager and have been supported with an assessment. We also know that I believe seven of them have received a Canada Ontario housing benefit, recognizing that with that benefit, you don't have housing. Um, but I think there are lots of different pieces in place that could help that process. Um, again, we know that there's um, uh, willingness in the system to really uh, work through this. And we also realistically are, you know, obviously looking at, you know, should there be um, a need for interim options um, at the end of the timeline, then we're also um, looking at those. Um, I'm not going to pretend that this is going to be easy, um, but if, if we're all around the table with the same focus, then I hope we can support in an empathetic and a way to look at you know, the next stage. Um, so thank you for that question. I hope that helps. Uh, it does. Thank you very much. Um, just a, a bit further of a question with regards to the case management. So aside from housing, is case management extending to um, supports in any other way with the current occupants? Um, through you, Mayor Patterson, maybe just to clarify your question, is it in addition to case management and OLS staffing, what supports are offered? Just maybe expand upon what the case management um, service provisions will be. So is it just locating housing? Is it accessing other services? Um, what's the extent of the case management that we're bringing to bear on the situation? Thank you, and through you, Mayor Patterson. Um, so uh, I think we've heard from delegations today that obviously with um, current OLS staff um, and, and other agencies, there is supports provided. Uh, the housing first piece and, and the kind of wrap around between city staff, housing first, um, the system as a whole, will really focus on a housing, housing solutions. Um, obviously, there are other agencies involved, and again, I'm, I don't feel like I'm the best person to speak to that, uh, but to support um, residents, and I think we've heard some great examples. I know, for instance, some dental supports, some education supports, there are other kind of wraparound pieces, but our focus, obviously, for the wind down, as per Council's direction, is to really focus on finding housing solutions. Thank you very much for that clarity and for adding another um, missing piece to the puzzle of helping people find uh, a permanent home. Uh, Councillor Stephen. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. Um, I just want to acknowledge everyone who was brave enough to get up here and speak today because it's terrifying, um, it's daunting. So uh, kudos to you, that takes guts. So, and, and thanks for sharing your stories and your thoughts with us, it is important. So we've got the cabin pilot winding down, and it sounds like OLS is kind of growing up or being forced to, I guess. Um, I'm really intrigued by this possible transition to private property. I'm really glad to see that staff have negotiated that if that can happen, the cabins can be sold for a dollar. I think that's excellent. And I think it's really interesting as well to see where OLS goes with funding that's not provided by the city. Because if it is the raging success that people say it is, I think you're going to be able to find something. So I, I do wish you luck that way. I just want to acknowledge that change is really hard. Um, good change is hard, bad change is hard, all change is hard. Uh, but as one of my favorite people says, uh, we can do hard things. So while you might leave here tonight feeling a bit disheartened, I understand that. Um, but I just want you to know that you are capable of continuing on. So don't stop. You're worth it. Keep going. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. I think it's worth hearing from uh, a member of council who voted against the wind down of the program as I did last November. I did not vote for the wind down of the program. If council rejected this motion tonight, staff direction would not change. The direction of a democratically elected body is to wind down this program. That's hard to hear, 
but that is the direction that this council has taken. They would come back in a week or two with another wind down program. That is where this program is going. Uh, I will say tonight, without debate, and without, without any sort of uh, divisions on council, we just voted for $11 million tonight when you count it all up on affordable and transitional housing. This is a compassionate council that really genuinely cares to solve homelessness and housing. My reluctance to vote for my now the program was based on the fact that some housing is better than no housing. And even if it isn't something that we can understand and accept, it is something that some people do call home. I do still maintain my fear that some of the people who are in OLS right now and in the sleeping cabins uh, will fall back into homelessness. But I want to echo some of the things Councillor uh, uh, Stephen said. I hope that this I hope that this program, we're seeing it, other communities roll this out. I hope that this rolls out into somewhere else, on a private property with a private funder, and that this continues. I think that there is something here, albeit without municipal support going forward, that there is something here that can fill a gap in the housing continuum that maybe will benefit down the road and will be a proof of concept. Um, so, you know, this is... These decisions are hard to make because this is a, a community that is deserving of, of a lot more of, of care and certainly a lot more efforts of, from other levels of government. Um, and it, th these decisions like this are never easy to make. Um, so uh, I, I am going to, I, I assume this is going to pass tonight, but I am going to dissent from this uh, for two re reasons. One, my fear of people falling into homelessness, and two, I don't like the idea of a program that is a pilot being shut down and being unanimously or near unanimously to sort of agreed to wind down. I think there is a value for pilots. There is a value for innovative solutions. And the only way we're ever going to get out of this homelessness crisis is if we try new things. So that will be my vote tonight. Uh, and that's where I stand. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Okay, so we will call the vote on Clause 2. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries 12 to 1. Uh, Councillor Tozo opposed. Okay, moving on to report number 44 from Planning Committee. Moved by Councillor Chnani, seconded by Councillor Glenn, that Report 44 from the Planning Committee be received and adopted. Okay, there are four clauses. Would anyone like any of the clauses dealt with separately? Councillor Glenn? Thank you. I'd like to deal with Clause 3 separately, please. Okay. All right. So we'll deal with Clause 3 separately. So first, um, we'll vote on the balance of the clauses. So Clause 1, Zoning Bylaw Amendment 47 to 67 Village Drive. Clause 2, Official Plan and Zoning Bylaw Amendment 2360 Street uh, and uh, Princess Street, sorry. And then Clause 4, Zoning Bylaw Amendment and Draft Plan Subdivision 1291 Midland Avenue. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, Clause 3, Official Plan and Zoning Bylaw Amendment 4085, 4091, and 4097 Bath Road. Councilor Glenn. Thank you, Mayor Pattis Patterson, and through you. Um, I asked to separate this clause because on April 4th, uh, when Planning Committee met, there were four developments up for consideration, and I wholeheartedly supported the other three that we just passed. But this one gave me grave concerns, and I voted against it. And I think everyone here should be aware of why that happened. And it was not a unanimous decision. Uh, Councillor Osanic also voted against this. So my comments are as follows. Firstly, although we're committed to increasing all forms of housing stock, I struggled with allowing in a time of a housing shortage and with municipal shortage of land, a sprawling development, in my opinion, clearly not affordable housing, and that we were stretching to put this in place. Um, among my most grave concerns, though, were about cutting over 750 trees and the lack of serious consideration for the environmental impact that this will have. This council just signed on to the Montreal Biodiversity Pledge and our strategic plan, in it, we committed to preserving our tree canopy and moreover, to expanding it. And 
you know, I'm a pragmatist. I understand that as we build, there's going to be the occasional tree that we are going to have to cut down. But this just seems a step too far. Because we're not simply talking about trees that provide a canopy, we're talking about an entire forest. We are talking about a space where other species live. And when we talk biodiversity, it's not just those trees, it's about everything that grows and lives amongst that forest space. Um, we also heard at our last council meeting that people have concerns about things like air quality. And you know, this proposal seeks to eliminate one of the best ways of creating good air quality for us by ensuring that we have a way of uh, getting the air to be a little bit cleaner. The reports that came before us, I also found that there were deficiencies in them, and it disturbed me. After seeing a number of other planning developments come forward, this one just seemed to be stretching and pushing on every boundary that we have set. I understand that the province has passed a number of bills and uh, has put us in a situation where we have minimal control sometimes over the developments in front of us. But I needed to speak out about this because I don't think that we can let it pass. I don't think that we can let it go on the way it is. And if we don't take a stand for the community and what we want to see this community look like, we'll be answerable to our children and our grandchildren moving forward. In addition to those environmental concerns which will be expanded upon, <laughs> I was very concerned and couldn't reconcile my own observations and experience that there would be no impact on traffic. For those who are unfamiliar with the proposal, the property is constrained by the north, uh, by the railway, to the west, by the creek, and to the east, there's a dead end road. That means all traffic, one way or another, even with the installation of private roadway, is coming down to Bath Road. That's 309 houses, not 309 people, 309 households emptying onto a road that is already on a regular basis, full of traffic coming to and from the city, particularly during rush hour. And the re traffic report that was provided was conducted in January, during a quieter time, not during the tourist season, when there's going to be people coming in and out, not when the marina is going and the boat launch is going to be in use, and it's not a big space over there. I know what it takes to uh, bring a boat into a water, and you require a lot of room. So I just couldn't fathom that there would be absolutely no impact. And maybe that impact isn't going to hit immediately, but the communities to the west of us are going to continue to expand, and that roadway is going to incur greater and greater levels of traffic. 30 seconds. Thank you. Um, so beyond all these reasons, uh, you know, I, I want to clarify that I understand that staff did a good job here. They're asked to compare against a criteria. They're asked to develop a professional opinion based on the regulations as they stand. But we as a council are here to judge whether that is enough. We are here to make a decision about whether this is act the best so course forward for I our I promise community. you, I did not cut off your mic, but that is a sign, <laughs> Councillor Glenn. Your mic, is, your mic is actually timed at five minutes, just so you know, so if that happens, so. Um, okay. I got, Thank the, you, uh, uh, got the hook. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is, there any, is there anybody else that wishes to, uh, to speak to close three? Councillor Sanic. Thank you, Your Worship. We exceeded our housing target last year by 250%. We were just awarded $2.5 million for meeting these targets. We are not going to rest on our laurels this year. Two minutes ago, we just approved 323 housing units. We are still approving, but approving all applications at all costs? No, that's not right. 
There are traffic problems with this development with no mitigation. 309 units, that could be 300 to 400 additional cars with no traffic lights. The traffic impact that was done in January did not take into uh, um, account the Collins Bay boat launch, which is the busiest boat launch in Kingston. There's also a shared center lane, and the traffic impact study said at peak times, actually turn into the center lane and then wait for your turn to get over that is illegal because you have to then cross over a solid line. You're not allowed to do half a turn and then half a turn um, at a different time. It's got to be all or one. So this development, it, has, it needs traffic lights and a right-hand turn lane, and none are proposed. Who's responsible for monitoring the discharge into Collins Creek from the sub subdivision stormwater? Who's going to check that the stormwater system is maintained? This is a condominium subdivision. That means it's up to volunteers from the condo residents. Does approving housing at all costs mean to destroy a natural heritage system and mature forest? 84% of this forest will be clear cut to just a mere 50 meters. Just the steep slope will be left with trees. That's it. This is not a forest of invasive species. The tree inventory, it shows that the forest is in good health. It contains native hardwood trees of significant ecological value. 42% of the trees are actually sugar maples. Black ash is present, and that's an endangered species at risk. We have 400, or sorry, 738 big trees at stake here. Um, this development is a major encroachment into the forest. We can't even get a location map for all of the trees in the tree inventory. Why is that? We've had them before in other developments at this stage. There's an oak that's 108 centimeters in diameter. Where's it located? We don't know. This forest is part of the wildlife corridor called the Collins Creek Natural Heritage System. The CRCA had to agree to disagree on size and linkages of the significant woodland status. Then in Bill, inter Bill 23 interfered. There is space in this development to save the forest and also have the same number of housing units. Just change the mix of homes. That is what I recommended back in 2022. Uh, more townhomes, less single detached homes. That would create a shift to the east that would then save more of that 300 meter diameter, like wide forest, and, but nothing, nothing was changed. In fact, what we saw now in 2024, the housing is even closer by 40 meters to the creek. The, this development contravenes section 2.8.2 of our official plan by reducing our forage coverage that is already below target. I need to move a deferral, your, um, your worship, to have a scoped EIS conducted on this woodland, and the clerk has the wording. Okay, Councilor Senate, I'm gonna pause your time there for a moment. Okay, so we have a motion to defer. Uh, moved by Councillor Osenic, seconded by Councillor Glenn, that the applications for official plan and zoning bylaw amendments submitted by Armitage Homes Limited and Arcadis on behalf of Francis H. Day, Clark Day, and Robert R. Kennedy for the property municipally known as 4085, 4091, and 4097 Bath Road be deferred until a new scoped environmental impact study is conducted by an independent third party planning ecologist and brought to council and that the new scoped environmental impact study A identifies the boundary of the significant woodland assessing each criteria for woodland significance based on the natural heritage reference manual for natural heritage policies and provides advice on whether the woodland buffer must be greater than the 50 meter buffer required by the Cataract Ray Region Conservation Authority B advises on the appropriate boundaries and buffer areas for the provincially significant woodland and significant valley land C assesses the application of no negative impacts policies on natural heritage features, and D, assesses the application of no negative impacts policies to the proposed stormwater management plan, and that a copy of this motion be provided to the ecologist retained to complete the environmental impact study for purposes of developing the scope of work to be completed, and that the funding for the study be funded from the working fund reserve up to $20,000. Okay, so we have a motion to defer on the floor. Remember, rules for deferral. One minute to speak. So, Councilor Senator, I'm going to put the three minutes and 30 seconds you have on the regular clock. I'm going to put that aside. So, as of now, you have one minute to speak, and then we'll open up the floor to discussion. Uh, Councilor Toza, did you have a point of order, or is it you just wanted to be on the speaker list? Okay, go ahead and line. Okay. Uh, Councilor Senate, go ahead. 
Thank you. So the place, it will be, the report will be coming back to council. The time, I think that it will just be like um, for the summer, one season only. Right now, as of yesterday, the Bird Migratory Act kicked in, so no trees are allowed to be cut down from now to the end of August, and we should have the report back to council there. As to um, the purpose, yes, um, the community experts, um, they, they're disagreeing with the results of the environmental impact study that was submitted. I think it's our due diligence as city council to ensure that cutting down this forest is the right thing to do. Um, we need someone to verify the buffer. Is 50 meters enough? I think this is in the name of public interest. If you look at the city of Toronto, they value their forest system $7 billion. What is the value of our forest system in Kingston, especially if we're going to be cutting it down? Why is the death by a thousand cuts? Every forest is important. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? I have the chair and recognize you. Uh, thank you. A quick question from staff. How much time would it take to follow this direction, do the study, and get the results back to council? Uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, there are a lot of variables that could come into play, um, finding the appropriate environmental consultant. Once that environmental consultant biologist is found, their ability to take on the work, uh, if they're working on other projects, uh, collecting the data, uh, reporting back and getting to council, I would give a window, it could be anywhere from four to eight months. Okay, I'm just gonna say this, that's totally unreasonable. Four to eight months. This is the sort of thing that gives municipalities a bad name when it comes to housing. This is why we see some of the messaging about how we can be blockages to housing. You know what, we are already past the time to make a decision on this. Housing is a crisis. Can I ask staff, how many housing units have we approved for 2024? Uh, thank you, and through you, to date, we have 93 building permits issued for 2024. 93. 93. We need 1,400, and we're at 93. This is a bad move. I'm going to ask council not to approve this deferral. Thank you. I return the chair. Okay, thank you. Next on my list is uh, Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Through you, you, you actually asked my main question, so I'm just going to say, this is difficult because we've got two main principles that are in conflict here. We need more housing of all types, and we need to be good environmental stewards. I've read through the report and it, I also, my f overall governing philosophy is more information is always better. And, but we need to work fast. So this is really a challenging deferral because it's asking for more information about environmental stewardship, but delaying housing. Um, when these principles come into play, I don't, there's not an easy solution here, but I'm going to support the deferral on this motion because we only have one environment, we only have one planet. Sorry, the housing would have to take a sidestep to that, the ecological considerations in my view. That's my perspective, um, so I'm voting for this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Through you, I'll be very quick. Um, I've reviewed the file and I've had a, a couple of conversations with Councillor Osanek about this. Um, if we look at our strategic plan, we've got two, uh, two bodies that are in competition with each other, more houses, protect our environment. Uh, Councillor Tozo hit it right on the head for what I'm thinking. A little bit more information I think is very valuable in a situation like this and I think we need to protect our forests and find a way that if, with this report will give us a little bit more information about that. So I'll be supporting this. Okay, Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. I just wanted to ask, Steph, is this already past the amount of time that the city has to make a decision on this file? Mr. Park? Through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, the uh, applicant is in a position to appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal. The application was received in 2021. Okay, so just for clarity then, even if we pass this tonight, the applicant could just tomorrow trigger the appeal and it goes completely out of our hands. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, that is correct if the applicant chose to take that route. All right, so 
with that, I can't support the deferral because we basically just hand off any control over the entire process again, which we've been doing far too much lately. This is on us to sort our way through it somehow. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Ostroff. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Post. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the discussion. I know how difficult this really all is. And um, I was wondering if I could ask uh, with the staff, uh, um, what what has been done and what, what um, I understood that there would be in the process uh, another environmental study that is part of it once it's approved. Is that not correct? Mr. Park. Thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, several supporting studies have been done already, one of which is an EIS, which was reviewed uh, and modified through consultation and approval with the CRCA. So that has formed the supporting study that is um, allowing staff to um, meet the policies in the, uh, support meeting the policies in the official plan. As part of the site plan process, the applicant will be required to do a more detailed uh, final EIS study to address any modifications to the development and really getting down, no, for lack of better terms, into the weeds in terms of uh, how things are, are going to be addressed on the property. Thank you. Okay, I think I understood that, uh, Mr. Mayor. I, I just feel that um, that's 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 our, our safety valve that I, I thought we had and, and, and that we've accepted the expertise of our planning team. And um, then why are we here, right? We, we have, it has gone through so much of the process and now we, we know that it has all the, all the forests and we're, we, we, our understanding as planning committee is that it, there will be extreme measures taken to ensure that this development will protect every tree possible. 10 seconds. Not random cutting. So that's, that's why I can't support it. I believe it's in place. It, it is there. We're imagining the worst. And I don't think that's going to happen. Okay, thank you. Councillor Chase. Thank you. I have a, actually a follow-up question to the question the mayor asked. So 93 building permits have been issued. How many proposals or units have been approved by planning or council this year? Commissioner Agnew. Uh, thank you. That's not information I know right off the top of my head. I'd have to get back to you on that, unless Mr. Park knows. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, I would just off the top of my head say it is somewhere within the range, including these four reports before council tonight, um, which have gone through planning committee, I would say is probably in the range between 700, 800 units approved, but not finalized. That is the big difference between 93 and 700. What's the main reason why those other 600, 700 units have not been approved or with their built building permits, and if you could guess. Well, if we're, through you, Mr. Mayor, if we're talking about applications that have gone to planning committee and council this year, they're still very early in the process. They still have to get final site plan approval or plan of subdivision, uh, and then they would have to go through the building permit process. So we do have a number in the pipeline? Uh, if they follow through with all the uh, remaining steps they need to do, such as site plan, entering into any related agreements, and then applying for permit, and the permits are issued. So there is a ways to go, but it's a number of steps that still need to be completed. And my understanding is that due to interest rates and building costs and contract that some developers are delaying their developments until interest rates lower. Is that true? Um, I'm not really able to speak to that directly. My understanding in discussions with the home builders is they are sitting and waiting a bit to see what happens with the interest rates because it's obviously very important to their financing. Okay, thank you. Um, so I would argue that last year we actually approved and had units 250% greater than we were entitled to or our, our goal. And this year, apparently this council so far has approved 750, between 780 units. So I think we have done our part at this point in time and we're only about four months in, four and a, three and a half months in. So I have no issue in uh, uh, supporting this deferral at this point in time, in order to get more information. 
and we'll, we can go from there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is Councillor McLaren. Thank you. When it is uh, that we have two values to choose from, it's important that we get this right. And it's also possible to actually preserve both of them. We heard that this is sort of a low density development that could be condensed into one area and save the trees and the forest. So um, as a result of deferral and getting the uh, value of the forest there, and the, that value is quite high, I imagine, um, would it also be possible to communicate to the developer that um, a change in plans that saves the forest, keeps the amount of units there, um, we can get both of them, both values preserved? Mr. Park? Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, certainly that message can be uh, shared with the developer. Of course, it would be up to them whether they chose to replan the site or not. Okay. Uh, considering that these are two values that uh, we value as councillors and as part of our strategic plan, it's important that we try that at the very least. So I'm going to support this deferral in the hopes that uh, we can save the forest and get housing at the same time. We don't need to choose it if we can get more information. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Councillor Son. Thank you, Your Worship. A uh, couple of questions for the staff. Um, the suggestion or concerns in this motion has uh, been expressed, or the comments from the colleagues, uh, is the city staff has considered those ahead of time. There was came to your knowledge uh, before we prepared the report or received the report to deal with those issues. Uh, such as uh, a conservation boundary line, how how far developer can go in in in, in such, such uh, areas or properties, or the traffic studies that uh, has been also blamed that it was not uh, uh, it, it was not done at the right time. It was the uh, month of January. So my first question is: all those allegation, I will not call allegation, but suggestion or concerns came to us tonight in this uh, motion, how you was not aware of it or you have not and we done something about it already okay. in the report. So that actually takes to you to your one minute, Councillor Hassan. So, but I'll give you a chance for, for staff to, uh, to respond. Mr. Burke. Uh, thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so as part of any application, uh, and they have to submit technical studies in support of their proposal, showing that they meet the policies of the provincial policy statement as well as the city's official plan. Those studies are done at a, a technical level that is, or I would say a feasibility level to make sure the project is supportable through the policies and developable. Obviously for the um, developer's sake, they need to know that it's something that can be supportable. Um, all those studies are reviewed by qualified professionals in those areas, uh, such as transportation consultants or ecologists, um, engineers, stormwater management experts. They review the technical uh, studies uh, that are uh, submitted to the study, work with the applicant, identify any concerns that they see, work with the applicant to correct those. Sometimes there's several iterations going back and forth. Uh, such as there was in the case with the uh, Conservation Authority. Once those commenting agencies and, uh, are, are satisfied that the supporting technical studies are supportable and meet the city's official plan policies as well as the provincial policy statements, that's when staff are in a position to bring forward a recommendation that uh, would change the official plan designation and the zoning on the property, which is what is before council tonight. However, that's just the start of the process. There's still detailed studies that have to follow, including transportation, including stormwater management flows, uh, an updated EIS. All those have to be done as a condition of site plan approval, which has to be in place and met before uh, a building permit can be issued for the site. Thank you. So, yeah, I'm afraid you're at one minute, so I'm gonna have to move on. I know one minute goes fast. Councillor Stephen. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. Um, just wondering for staff, because I want us to go into this with our eyes wide open, just knowing exactly what we're getting into here. So if 
council approves the deferral tonight, or if, we, if this passes, then what could happen is either that study happens and everything goes along tickety-boo or the person appeals. If they appeal, what might happen? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, sorry, could you just repeat that last part, Councillor? Don't start my time again. <laughs> if, if the applicant, so whether council defers or refuses this application, whatever happens tonight, if the applicant chooses to appeal, what might happen when they do that? Hmm. Well, if, through you, Mr. Mayor, if they appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal, that would result in a hearing at the Land Tribunal. Um, that would then uh, result in, uh, if the council were to refuse it, staff have recommended the report, therefore staff cannot go and support the report. Council would have to find outside uh, planning consultants to go and say why it isn't supportable. Um, and the city staff could be subpoenaed to the hearing to give um, evidence based on the staff report that we wrote supporting it. Uh, and it really comes down to then the tribunal making a decision of whether it is good planning or not. Okay, I hear there's a desire for more density. I think there's agreement. We can have homes and trees. We can do both. So if this goes to the OLT, if the applicant appeals, is this design in front of us the baseline or could it get worse? Through you, Mr. Mayor, that, that is um, right now the application that is, is before uh, Council for Consideration is what would be before the Tribunal for Consideration. Okay, this is really difficult, you guys. Thank you. Okay, is there anybody else that wishes to speak to the deferral? Councillor Chinani. Hey, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so the numbers that we were speaking about, about uh, so other levels of government, when they look at what our housing targets are, it's based on um, when they get a building permit for when it's at grade, is that correct? Uh, I beg your pardon, Councillor. I was having trouble hearing you, just uh, the, the volume. If you could repeat your question, please. Um, so the other levels of government, when they recognize that uh, added to our housing target, at numbers, it's when you get a permit when they start building at grade, is that correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, the upper level tiers of government, most of the funding attached to, to housing starts is connected to building permit issuance. Okay, um, yeah, so I had some, I was kind of like half and half at planning on this and after reflecting um, and speaking with others, I would have probably voted differently. Um, knowing that they could have um, built more density where there was no trees or less trees and then have like a better uh, mix. Um, so yeah, I will support the deferral on that. Councillor Glenn. Uh, thank you and through you. So I'm gonna talk as quick as I can to this. Um, we don't have a crystal ball about what's going to happen, but uh, just to address a couple of points, um, we're actually asking for a scoped EIS, so the timeline on it is going to be much faster. We have a quote that says this will only be a few weeks, so I think that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, as for uh, you know being assured that we're going to save every tree possible, I don't think that that's actually accurate at all. Uh, twice during this process, to my understanding, they were asked to consider moving the development to um, the east side where they would not have to impact the trees and they still have not um, given that adequate consideration from what I can see. So Councillor McLaren, although I appreciate what you're saying, I, I actually am not particularly hopeful that that's going to happen. I'd also like to point out that we did just approve 323 units tonight. I understand it takes time to get those things brought forward. However, you know, ten, the, ten re the reality of this is this is going to be a long-term um, change to our community and the deferral is worth um, giving consideration to at this point and I'm voting for it, obviously. Okay, anybody else on the deferral? Councillor Senate, you have the last word if there's anything you want to say. 
It's your oh. worst. <laughs> so, okay, my fellow counselors, I'm really sorry it's so hard to save a forest, but we have to try. Someone sent us a great line last night. We have to walk the talk. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we will call the vote on the motion to defer. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries by a vote of nine to four. Uh, Mayor Patterson, Councillor Hassan, Councillor Bohm, and Councillor Ostroff opposed. Okay, uh, moving on to uh, no other reports. We have nothing from Committee of the Whole. Information reports, if you have any questions, just uh, raise your hand as I read through them. Number one, February 2024 tender and contract awards subject to delegation of authority. Number two, 2023 development charges reserve fund statement. Number three, automated speed enforcement program update. Number four, oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Shapes. Sorry, I missed you. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, I have one question. I was reading the report and just a little confused one thing it stated in the very, uh, the first paragraph it states, intersections, uh, if the AS ASEs are going to be placed at intersection, I'm just wondering if that's actually true or is, I find it difficult that would actually be effective if they're actually at an intersection because I would be hoping people would be slowing down. Mr. Seppel. Uh, thank you. Um, and through you, Mr. Mayor, my apologies, Mr. Shave. That's a, or Councillor Shaves, that's a, that's a typo. Um, so we're referring to the, um, we've identified the, the list of, um, of eligible community safety zones that it would be placed in be placed back from the intersection. Okay, so they'd be like in the middle of the street? Or they between? Would, yeah, they would, they, <clears throat> through, your, your, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, they would be placed within um, um, the community safety zones where those existing zones are in and around the school areas. And between intersections? Yes. Okay, thank you for that confirmation. Okay, I just have Councillor Osterhoff and then Councillor Osanek. Uh, Councillor Osterhoff, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Patterson. Just a, just a question, Mr. Semple. Um, is when at what point do, do the a um, the automated speed enforcement become uh, profitable um, and not a, a burden? Um, I know the last report you said there's still not was at the break even point. Have we reached the break even point yet of being able to pay for that? And can you fill us in on that? Mr. Um, Thank you, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So these, um, there, we have two, we have two automated enforcement systems um, in the city that we're looking at. So the red light cameras um, have been in in place for um, uh, almost two years, um, and are gathering revenue based on those. The uh, the automated speed enforcement program um, will not be implemented until the fall. Um, so it, the financing plan for how those um, cameras and the, and the fines associated with the tickets that are issued um, uh, remain the same as what was, was presented to council when it was approved, uh, be, because we haven't seen any of those um, those actual sort of um, actually the, the tickets actually coming in and what that modeling would be. Uh, what I can say is that since we brought the report, you know, we we have been looking at. Um, you know, other communities and continue to understand that we don't have any changes to the financial model that was presented and approved by council um, at that time. So it, it currently um, is funded in the same way as what was approved at that time. Thank you. Councilor Senek. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just have one question for Director Semple, and that's how do the cameras work if it's um, two lanes of a highway on both sides? So one of, the, um, one of the highways is Bath Road, right? And that's four lanes, two on each side. So do we have to have two cameras on you know, the eastbound traffic, or do we just um, point the camera in the one lane and the other lane um, won't be monitored for the speed? Um, uh, through you, Miss, uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, it, in instance, the, the speed would be monitored in one direction. And then both lanes, both, both lanes in the um, one direction. Through, um, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, Councillor Sanic, yes, um, but I, 
uh, specific to those locations, I think part of what we're looking at in the report right now, we've identified um, 29 locations, but one of the next steps that we take is is the vendor um, um, and the, the experts with the, with the camera technology would be looking at each of those locations and identifying if it's feasible for, for the ASC to operate in there. Um, so I just would be, before I speak in too much detail about how it would work at any of those locations, I think we need to work through those, that next technical step with the vendor. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, we'll move on. We have no information reports to members of council. Miscellaneous business, oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Glenn, did I? Bylaw enforcement, yes, Councillor Glenn, go ahead. Uh, thank you, and through you. I just had a question with regards to this. Um, so thank you very much for putting together what I think is a, a very thorough policy. Uh, but I thought perhaps we could take a moment just to talk about the political interference piece. I think it's important that our constituents understand the limits of what we can do. And so if um, somebody from staff can speak to that boundary uh, to create that kind of level of understanding. And also uh, I have another question about um, all city employees must take reasonable steps um, within their authority to ensure that enforcement operates independently and free from political intervention. Um, so just, is there a definition of reasonable? Mr. Reason. Thank you, and through you, your worship. Um, and thank you for your question, Councillor Glenn. So the city prosecutes offenses, well, The city prosecutes offenses. I'll just, uh, it's, it's a fundamental principle that the city must enforce its bylaws in a way that's fair and transparent. And in order to do that, it's critical that, and in, it's equally as important that it do it and be seen to do it. And for that to happen, as you say, and as the policy says, it must be free from political influence. And so, because the concern, of course, is that if council is taking a tremendous interest in one particular bylaw contravention or one particular enforcement action, that it will appear to the community uh, and it may influence staff to change the way that they would make decisions when deciding whether or not to take enforcement action or what type of enforcement action to take. So. I mean, with respect to the second part of your question, is there a definition of reasonable? No, and lawyers spend many hours and many dollars arguing about what is reasonable in particular circumstances. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the policy is intentionally um, high level, is to allow for those discussions to take place. Uh, Commissioner Agnew. Thank you, and through you, certainly, I'm not going to pretend to be um, a lawyer in this circumstance, but maybe offer just an explanation on the practical application side of what this means to us. Um, so on the enforcement side of things, certainly councillors shouldn't feel like if there are concerns in your district or things that you see that you can bring them to staff's attention. I think where the independence of action comes in is that's where staff take the situation under advisement, they'll go and do their own independent review and make a decision as to the best course of action. I think in this case, it's really for council to understand that it's not appropriate for you to be directing any form or type of enforcement. Certainly you can raise an issue, but then the independence of action has to come in. And I think that's really what that part of the policy speaks to. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think all of us have been asked at one time or another by a constituent to intervene in a situation uh, that pertains to bylaws. So I thought it was important to get that out that um, to maintain that fairness and to ensure that we're unbiased, that we don't interfere in those processes. Um, we can look at the overall big picture, but we can't intervene in individual cases. So thank you for um, illuminating uh, those of us here and those of uh, watching on just what those boundaries are and why they're in place. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. I'll remember that definition of reasonable and the next time one of my counselors calls me unreasonable, so thank you very much. Um, <laughs> you laughed a little too hard at that, Mayor Patterson, and I just wanted to highlight that. Um, so this is in response to the community standards bylaw and the enforcement policy, if I'm remembering correct. 
So do we have any idea when we're going to get the health equity uh, review back from, uh, because I don't know if this directly ties to it, but Dr. Glaza was going to write that. Do we have an idea when we'll get that back? Ms. Morley. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship, we were directed by Council to uh, produce the health equity impact assessment at the one-year follow-up mark from the implementation of the Community Standards Bylaw, so that would be May of 2025. Thank you. A very reasonable answer. Okay. Councillor Shapes. Thank you. Um, quick question. I, I know that it, our bylaws are, are based on a complaint-driven process. However, it's come to my attention a few times, people have brought forward uh, complaints. However, in speaking with some of the people that were complained upon, uh, it appears that sometimes there are neighbor grievances and they might use bylaw enforcement as a way of um, inflicting something upon their, their neighbors. Meanwhile, I'll take, for example, say the watering bylaw. So their neighbors watering in an inappropriate time or date Meanwhile, five other neighbors are doing so, but the neighbor only complains about one. Is there a process to, uh, um, we'll say, sort of deal with that or make it more common? As in, if, if that does happen, the other five neighbors or so in the neighborhood also gets uh, a talking to, or do we talk to the actual complainant and say, um, listen, uh, why aren't you complaining about the other five? Because if, if that one neighbor is aware of the other five may also get a warning that maybe they won't be as uh, vindictive, if I may use that word. Mr. Reason. <clears throat> Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. Um, so the city, has, uh, the city has a broad discretion with respect to how it enforces its bylaws, and the policy recognizes that. Um, so firstly, staff, the policy recognizes that staff and bylaw enforcement officers always have a discretion in terms of how they want to enforce a contravention or a bylaw contravention. Um, and they have the discretion if there's, if they believe a complaint has been made in, in bad faith or for an improper purpose and the contravention is trivial, they have the flexibility to, to uh, deal with it accordingly under the, under the bylaw. I'd also note that although the bylaw, or the, although the policy recognizes that most of the city's bylaws are enforced um, in a reactive way based on complaints. It does permit directors to prescribe uh, proactive enforcement and investigation um, measures. So something, you know, if a director identified a systemic problem where complaints were being weaponized or used to, uh, you know, used as a weapon in a, a neighbor dispute, um, the director has the discretion to, to prescribe something like what you're describing, where uh, officers would then also go around a prescribed area and, and try to identify other similar bylaw contraventions. Okay, thank you. I just want to point that out, and hopefully staff will take that into consideration. Okay, if there's no other questions, uh, we'll continue on. We have no information reports from members of council. Miscellaneous business, uh, we have a couple of motions. First moved by Councilor Ridge, seconded by Councilor Glenn. That is requested by Hannah Blaine, museum assistants. I'm sorry. Yes. Would somebody else agree to move this? Moved by Councilor Toso. Thank you. Okay, so how about we say for number one, moved by Councillor Tozo, second by Councillor Glenn, as requested by Hannah Blaine, Museum Assistant, City of Kingston. Council designate the event Rip and Sip, scheduled from Friday, May 17th, 2024, at the Pump House Museum at 23 Ontario Street, Kingston, as an event of municipal significance, to which a special occasion permit may be issued by the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario. Number two, moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor Chinani, that the resignation of Jane Kingsland from the Frontenac, uh, Kingston Frontenac Public Library Board be received with regret. And that in accordance with section 3.3.2D of the public appointment policy, Marcus Letourneau be appointed from the reserve pool to the Kingston Frontenac Public Library for a term ending November 14th, 2026. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, on to new motions. We have uh, one new motion. A move by Councillor Bohm, seconded by Mayor Patterson, whereas the city of Kingston is a single tier municipality, largely responsible for most community services 
residents see and experience, and whereas the powers and services of municipal governments are determined by the provincial government, and the city of Kingston is responsible for providing many of the services residents rely on every day, including airports, animal control and bylaw enforcement, arts and culture, fire and emergency services, garbage collection and recycling, maintenance of local roads, parks and recreation, public transit, planning new community developments and enhancing existing neighborhoods, provincial offenses administration, sidewalks, snow removal, social services, social housing, storm sewers, and tax collection. Whereas the City of Kingston is consistently providing services and funding in areas of provincial and federal jurisdiction because of a lack of investment, including in the areas of mental health and addictions, access to primary care, enabling the building of supportive housing, infrastructure, and others. Therefore, be resolved that a special meeting of council be called in Q2 2024 to allow Kingston's members of provincial parliament and members of parliament to speak to council on what their respective levels of governments are doing on housing, mental health and addictions, health care and infrastructure, and the staff be directed to coordinate with the offices of Ted Shu, MPP, Kingston and the Islands, John Jordan, MPP, Lanark Frontenac, Kingston, Mark Gerritsen, MP, Kingston and the Islands, and Scott Reed, MP, Lanark Frontenac, Kingston, to select a date for the special meeting of council, and the staff be directed to place the date of the special meeting of council on a future council agenda as an item of miscellaneous business for approval. Councillor Bohm, you have the floor. Thank you, Your Worship and Three. I know it's late. Um, I didn't actually do the wording for this. Uh, I had help from staff, so it's not as complicated as it seems. In the grand scheme of things, a lot of issues have come before our council in the last little bit involving all the levels of government. The whole goal of this, let's get everybody in the same room. Let's figure out who's working on what. We can discuss funding at later dates, but basically it's to get us all on the same page, have a talk with them, be able to just have a free conversation. All this does is set the stage for that and they'll pick a date that you know hopefully we can all make. And staff have already had some preliminary discussions with their offices. So there's no there's no hidden agenda here or anything. It's just we're all we're all gonna get together and have a good little chat. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak to new motion number one? Councilor Senek. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just wanted to ask a question to the movers. Is the intent that it would be a public meeting and that the public could ask questions too, or would it just be council asking questions to them? I believe it would just be council because if it was a public meeting, I, I would have concerns that it would never end. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure if they would agree. <laughs> yeah, could yeah. so it would, be, it would kind of be the whole idea and the premise is the three levels of government getting together and having just a good open discussion about where we're going, what needs to be done, and basically our area of responsibilities because we seem to have a lot of things being downloaded on us and we need to know what's going on at the upper levels to support that. Thanks. Thanks for the clarification. Okay, Councilman McLaren. Thank you. I just, uh, I wasn't quite clear on the answer there. Um, although the public won't be able to participate, will they be able to watch? Is this going to be like a secret meeting or is it public? Okay, so in the sense that they can actually <laughs> listen, right? <laughs> and in that sense, they could text us and we could ask for them. Is that correct? Council McLaren, it will not be a secret meeting. <laughs> okay. Promise. Okay. Uh, Councilor Tozo. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. So during the secret meeting, can we, no. Uh, no, I, I, in all seriousness, um, I just wanted to say I really love this motion. This is something I know both you and I privately have really talked about, a major frustration of local government. This is a great idea, and this is something that should happen regular, yearly, yeah, uh, that we should be able to talk to our upper levels of government in an formalish kind of way and see what's going on. Because so often the communication goes up to them, we never get anything back unless it's orders and directives. So brilliant motion, happy to support, looking forward to our secret meeting. Thank you. Uh, Kenzie Glenn. Uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm concerned that we're not actually going to get what we're hoping for out of this. Given that it's in front of the public, um, I, I don't foresee them being able to make any kind of commitments or that we will necessarily get the answers that we're hoping for. And I, I, I think all of us are aware of what it's like to be in politics, that we can't give commitments without having a foundation on which to make them, that we can't um, answer questions without having information um, on which to rely upon. So I'm not sure really how productive this is going to be. And that, that concerns me greatly that we're going to spend this time 
only to have people put on a bit of a performance, say that, you know, they're committed to this, committed to that, but there'll be nothing really generative that comes out of this. I think there's an awful lot of initiatives that are going on right now, and we actually do know what the governments are doing. They've both just released budgets. Um, we know that both AMO and FCM are uh, working with them on a regular basis, and I think those efforts are bearing fruit. We've seen some of those things come through, at least in the federal budget um, and pre-budget announcements. So I'm really reticent to call other levels of government out like this, and I know that it's been couched as this is a friendly thing, but how would you feel if they said to us, hey, why don't you come on down to Queen's Park? We'd like to have a conversation with you in front of everybody else. <laughs> but we're going to ask you what you're doing. We're going to delve into that. We're going to ask you a whole pile of quest tough questions in public and put you on the spot. Well, okay, I'm glad you feel that way. Um, but again, I think without the support of uh, information um, and all of those things beforehand, it, I'm not so sure that this is going to get us where we want to go. And I think you would find yourselves hesitating to answer some of the questions that would be put to you. So um, I'm not sure that I can support this. Um, you know, if it goes on, I'll participate, obviously, but it, it, I just don't want us to be spending time that could be better spent uh, elsewhere. Okay, Councillor Tozo. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Sun, sorry. No, 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 you've had your turn. <laughs> Councillor Sun. Ouch. Thank you, Worship, and through you. Uh, I think this is a great idea. Um, I will even suggest that once, uh, it, it's not having conversation or having a commitment from them, you just, they can brief us what is going on behind the scene in, in the other level of government and what kind of project they are working uh, for Kingston, for, for the local community. Um, if we can invite them just for the briefing, not for the questions, to just brief us every six months or maybe once a year, that will be a great idea. And I think that that's a good initiative and, and I, I appreciate it. So. Um, as the Councillor Grant said, that if they call us there, we'll tell them we are busy to fill the potholes, we are busy to put the cameras on to control the uh, traffic, and we are busy to build the houses for them, what they ask us to do it. So it's a lot of things we can tell them what we do here. And they don't do anything up there for us. OK, thank you. Um, thank you. Councillor Rich, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. There was a bit of hesitation there. Um, I, I, I really like this motion. Or I'm, I'm going to be very brief. Uh, I think that aside from potentially some of the language signaling there may be some frustration uh, with higher levels of government, I also think that this is an excellent opportunity for everybody, all of the representatives representing a district, to actually get together and discuss things. And you know, often, uh, often when you are working at Queen's Park or you're working um, on the Hill, um, those communication pieces, you're more focused on communicating with constituents or with your voter base than you are necessarily with other levels of government in terms of coordinating or, or even just clearly communicating what it is that you're doing to better the lives of people in your riding. So I think that this is a really good opportunity for coordination, uh, for sharing, and, um, and I think that I hope that everyone accepts the invitation. Thank you, Councillor Nanny. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I agree with that. It's a great opportunity to share, and then it, it, it's really good to make um, connections, like in person especially, um, because it, you end up being able to like uh, form more of a relationship, or maybe you haven't had a chance to speak to um, some of these representatives. I know there's a few of those on the list that I have never spoken to, so the, it, it's good to to build that relationship, and then they understand what our what our problems are and our struggles, and then you know we can get some feedback from them and of what is possible or not possible or 
or what's coming down. And it's like, uh, it's like uh, Councillor Ridge uh, mentioned, um, they bring that back. And then you see it when they, they post their, their uh, videos on, online about, this is what my constituents say, this is what the city, this is what city council spoke about. And then it gives them more opportunity to, to bring those stories um, up to upper levels of government. Okay, there's nobody. Oh, I'm sorry, Deputy Mayor Amos. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. Uh, I'll be very, very brief. Um, my only, uh, I, I will be, I'll support this motion. I have no issue with that. My only r tiny red flag going off on this uh, proposal is um, I want to ensure it, it is an information sharing session and that the upper levels of government can share their concerns, share their uh, where they hope to go, but I don't want to see a sales pitch. Uh, I have zero interest in that. Um, I don't want to hear party politics. I want to hear what their concerns are from their levels and then work as, as, a, as three levels of government to try and uh, to come to some sort of consensus. And that's my only tiny, tiny red flag with this, is good constructive conversation really goes a long ways in helping multiple levels of governments as long as everyone listens and no sales pitches. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Bohm, you have the last word. Thank you. I'll just reserve my right to speak last because I'm speaking last. Um, no, no, no laughs. All right, fair enough. It's late. <laughs> Allow myself to introduce myself. Um, so yeah, I'm really just thinking at the end of the day that in 10 years on council now, this will be the first time that we've all been together. So I'm just shocked that there would be really any consternation or anybody raising, you know, concerns about us all getting together in a collaborative, coordinated manner. This has been shared with their offices. There's no secrets here. There's no secret meeting. This is meant to put all three levels of government in the same room to discuss the frustrations of all of our residents. Because I'll tell you right now, one of the number one things I heard at the door in all the elections was why can't governments talk to each other more? Why can't they collaborate more? Why can't they coordinate more? Why is there so many duplications of services? Why does a city build a basketball court right beside a school that already has one and they're, and they're both sitting there empty half the time? So th this is literally just to get us all in the same room and try to get us on the same page. Is it gonna, is it gonna fix everything? Heck no, there's way too much on the agenda. But we can maybe do this every six months, every year based on schedules. I feel like this is something I'd like to see happen across every municipality. What has prevented us from doing this in the past? The only time we've all been in the same room is for big announcements, and you know you're not discussing policy at that. You're all shaking hands because a bridge was built or money was given for something. So in the in the grand scheme of things, like I, I'm just really shocked that there's like kind of any resistance to this at all. Um, I, I would think that you know this is really what we were elected to do. Um, the frustrations are there; they're not going to go away. Personally, I'd actually like to hear their frustrations. I'd like to know what they're struggling with and maybe we can support in that. So I'm gonna leave it at that. I know it's late and we still have to go back upstairs after. So um, thanks for, oh no, we do not. Yes, thank you. Okay, excellent. Uh, belay that. <laughs> I'll be going up. Councilor Anyways. Boom, you're welcome to go upstairs afterwards. <laughs> We're not right. going. Uh, I'll be upstairs thank after you. the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I, I hope that this passes and, and this sets a, a precedent going forward that we'd at least have a yearly meeting uh, with the other uh, federal and provincial representatives of the city of Kingston. Thank you. Okay, we'll call the vote on new motion number one. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries by a vote of 12 to 1. Councillor Glenn opposed. Okay, uh, we have no other new motions. Are there any notices of motion? Uh, if not, Madam Clerk, ask for minutes, please. Moved by Deputy Mayor Amos, seconded by Councillor Stephen, that the minutes of Council Meeting 11-2024, held Tuesday, April 2nd, 2024, be confirmed. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, we have some communications. Is there any other business? Councillor Tozo? Thank you, Mayor Parison. I'll be very brief. Uh, 
on Saturday, June 8, 2024, there will be an inclusive fun fair at Shannon Park, led by the Inclusive Play Project. Between uh, starting at 10 a.m., there are over 30 partners that have signed up. I hope everyone can attend. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Madam Clerk, Officer Bylaws, please. Okay, before I read the two bylaw votes, I just want to point out that bylaws eight and nine on the agenda have been withdrawn as a result of the deferral of the bathrobe planning matter. So first vote moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff, that bylaws one through seven, 10, 12, and 13 um, be given their first and second reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, vote number two moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff, uh, that bylaws one, two, Five through seven and 10 through 13 be given their third reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Motion to adjourn, please. Moved by Councillor Shaves, seconded by Councillor Tozo. All those in favor? Opposed? And we're adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>